So I want to talk about mutilation, body modification, and uh, eventually get to uh, castration. And I want to start this out by not really quite a case history, but a little bit of a case history about this book called Geek Love. Anybody here read this book? So uh, you all have good summer reading. Uh, here you go. Uh, this is a novel written by this woman, Catherine Dunn, uh, about a circus family. And uh, what happens in this family is that the parents want their kids to be able to be successful in the circus, so they do various things. When the wife gets pregnant, they do various things, so the kids will have some sort of mutations, right? So they'll be good circus performers. And um, the story is written in the uh, uh, first person by uh, one of the kids, who's a girl, and she has some kind of, uh, I can't remember what her powers were, some kind of mental powers. Uh, maybe she's got telekinesis or something. No, the other one has telekinesis. But one of the characters is her brother, who was born without arms and legs. He just has basically flippers, and they call him Aqua Boy. That's his, that's his, uh, his, uh, his sideshow thing. He runs, he, they have him swim in the water, you know, kind of like a seal, whatever. But he has, pro he has these powers, or he doesn't have really m much in the way of powers. She has the telekinesis powers, and what she does is, is that she is able to levitate him and move him around, do these kind of things that are really quite magical. And what happens in the book is that he develops a cult following, and he becomes sort of a cult leader. And in the book, the idea is that people join the cult, and they worship him, and the idea is to become more like him over time. And so what people do is they start modifying their bodies to be more like Aqua Boy. They cut their fingers off, and they cut their hands off, they cut their feet off, and they cut their legs, and they proceed through a step till they become like him, and they have all their limbs removed. Right, that's the ultimate step. It's like joining Scientology where you amputate things. Right, so at the end, you know, they, they, they reach this final state and it's not quite clear what happens to me. If they get sent off somewhere or something, you know, they get killed or whatever. Uh, it's a really interesting book. I highly recommend it. It's really weird and creepy. And so um, they, they made a play out of it. And I, I haven't seen it uh, being uh, done any time recently, but they made a play out of it. Uh, somebody ought to make a movie out of this. I don't know why that hasn't been done. I think somebody needs to get to, uh, to what's his name? The guy who just did the movie Us, Peel, and get him to do this as a movie. I think this would be a great movie for him to do. So um, if I had talked to him, I'd say, man, you got to do this movie. Um, very interesting. So, I, uh, uh, so this, is, this is a good, no movie done from this. But it also, but again, is this idea of body modification goes on here. So this idea of body modification. And again, this idea that I keep reiterating over the semester of how gullible human beings are. If one person does it, other people will do it. So in this case, in this, in this book, you know, they join a cult. The cult is that you modify your body. And so if one person's doing it, must be good. I'll do it too, right? So you see that in this book. Uh, the other place uh, where you see this, and there is a film, is uh, this movie uh, called Freaks. Has anybody seen this film? Oh, you all have something so fun to look forward to. This is one of them. This was a movie like when I was in college. Um, we had uh, we had a, um, a a cine club, you know, a film club. I think we have one here. Mm -hmm. And the cine club uh, put on movies every weekend, and they got one of the big classrooms like this, and they put on films every weekend. And um, in fact, the classroom was a lot bigger than this, and. Um, they would, people would come uh, and we'd put the movies on. My friends were running the cine club. They would stick movies probably about 11 at night and go till like four in the morning. And people would come to watch the movies under, how shall I say this in a nice way, genteel way. They were under, under the influence of various substances. <laughs> and so uh, the movies were picked uh, so that they would heighten the effect of whatever substances people were on. And this was one of the perennial movies that was shown every year by the cine club, usually at midnight. Um, uh, uh, because it had, it was so, it was so freaky, you know, to use the title, it was so freaky and weird, and so this was the one that was, got, was the most popular one. Uh, this is a movie by a guy named Todd Browning. Uh, Todd Browning, why is his name in big lights? He was the producer of this. Why was his name in big, big letters in this? And, and Todd Browning uh, came to fame. I believe he was the guy who did uh, the original uh, Dracula movie with Bela Lugosi. He'd done some of these early movies and had maybe King Kong too, I can't remember. He'd done a couple movies, at least one movie that was really successful. I think it was Dracula. And he had been really successful and he was the darling of Hollywood. And everybody, oh, this guy's great. You know, anything he does turns to gold. So we're just going to, so he said, we're going to let him go and do his own project, right? 
And so he can do anything he wants to do in Hollywood. He can make any movie he wants to make. And this is the movie he decides to make, Freaks. A movie about circus freaks. This is the movie he decides to make. And he makes this movie, and it so freaks people out. Again, to overuse that word, it so flips people out. Uh, they get so, so weirded out by this that it ruins Browning's career. Oh. Ruins his career. So after this movie, he is done. Hollywood is done with him. I don't believe he ever makes another movie after this. I may be wrong about that. I don't think he ever, he, he never has another successful movie after this. And so this movie was his crowning achievement. And it's a movie of uh, circus performers. And what they did for the film was very interesting. They got real circus performers. They got real people who had, uh, we won't say body modifications, because most of these uh, things that these people had were just how, you know, like to quote Lady Gaga, they were born this way. Um, but then in the end, there is, I don't want to give the movie away, in the end there is a, uh, a, a, uh, uh, culminating scene of that, that involves like a really heavy duty body modification. I'm not going to say any more next. I really don't want to give it away. Um, so this is a great movie. Uh, you guys should see this. The whole thing is available on, uh, it's a Portuguese version, uh, Portuguese subtitles, but it's in English. It's available on YouTube and you can go and watch it now. Uh, yes? Yeah. Oh yeah, they are definitely drawing from this. This has inspired a lot of other things. You know, I mean, Browning never, you know, it, it, it screwed up his career, but subsequently, you know, this has become like a cult. You know, so anybody doing any sort of horror movies involving anybody who's a little bit not, you know, it's normal looking, there's an homage to this. And there's a bunch of other movies that you can see that are there's an homage to this. Um, yeah, this is, this is a really, really famous movie. Uh, let me show you the trailer. Just because, why not? <laughs> you didn't lie to your folks. We told you we had living, breathing monstrosities. You laughed at us. Uh, and yet, but for the accident of birth, you might be even as they are. They did not ask to be brought into the world, but into the world they came. So, uh, I don't know if you caught the plot there, but basically one of the little people falls in love with this, uh, the trapeze lady, and she pretends to love him because he's going to inherit a bunch of money, but she's really hanging out with the strongman guy, 
And so, uh, so she ends up, but she really comes out and despises all the freaks. And then at the end, you know, she does something bad, and I won't tell you what happens to her. Uh, it's a great movie. You ought to watch it. Um, got something to do this weekend. You got things to do. So this is, you know, put this on the list. Um, okay. All right. Let's talk a little bit about history of self mutilation. And mostly we're going to talk about self mutilation. Um, and really, we can start talking about uh, religious ideas of, uh, of self-mutilation or religious symbolism. And again, we see this in a number of uh, religions in the world. We can look at the ancient Greeks, and we know that uh, Hippocrates, the Greek physician who lived, you know, 460 to 370 before the Common Era, um, you know, advocated some aspects of something we might consider to be body modification, uh, bloodletting, blistering, etc. And these were practices that were well known in ancient Asian medicine, which also may have influenced Hippocrates. They were practicing a lot of these things in ancient China, for instance. And some of those ideas may have made it to uh, the Greek islands. And, uh, and so we have you know, some, some of this stuff influencing Western physicians. We're going to talk more about medical body modifications near the end of the lecture. So just hang on to that idea. Um, we have in uh, Hindu mythology, um, the idea of this guy named Sordas, who's a devotee of Lord Krishna. And Sordas sees uh, Krishna, sees God directly, has what is, in Hinduism is called darshan. And the sight is so wonderful that in order to preserve it, he basically pokes out both of his eyes. And this is the literally meaning of Sordas. The literal meaning of the word Sordas is blind disciple. Okay, so here he's doing a body modification of poking out his eyes. Does that remind you of something that we've already talked about in here? Another guy who pokes out his eyes is who? Foundation of Western psychology. Yeah? Freud comes up with what? What's the major idea of Freud's? Oedipal complex. What does Oedipus do? Pokes his eyes out. Now, Oedipus pokes his eyes out because he realizes that he's been sleeping with his mother. Okay, again, a good example of genetic sexual attraction. So again, if you write your dissertation on genetic sexual attraction, you'll get to retell the story of Oedipus because it's a good story of it. Freud was on to something he didn't realize, right? So, uh, but he pokes his eyes out because he realized he slept with his mother. Sordis is poking his eyes out because he doesn't want to see anything else because he's seen, he's seen, seen the face of God and, and he doesn't want his eyes to be polluted by anything else, his vision to be polluted by anything else, so he pokes his eyes out. Okay? Forms of body modification. Then we have the Bible. Mark 9, uh, 47 to 48, if your eyes are downfall, tear it out. Better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye than to be thrown out with both eyes into Gehenna, hell, where the worm dies not and the fire is never extinguished. Eventually in this class I will do a lecture on Satanism and hell. That's coming up for the next version of this class. Not for you guys. Uh, Matthew 6, 22 to 23, what I'm to say to you is anyone who looks lustily at a woman has already committed adultery with her in his thoughts. If your right eye is your trouble, gouge it out and throw it away. Better to lose part of your body than to have it all cast into Gehenna. Okay, so lots of body modification religious-wise, somehow seeming to relate to eyes. Um, there seems to be, eyes seem to be a common thing that religious groups tell you to, you know, get rid of. I don't know why that is. Uh, we're going to talk about some other things that uh, people get rid of religious, for religious reasons a little bit later on. We'll talk about some more religious body modification kind of stuff happening, self-mutilation kind of stuff happening. Uh, but the eyes seem to be uh, at least popular, at least in a number of places. Don't try this at home. Please protect your eyes. They're very important. Okay. Um, so we also have the case of uh, where we know that some tribes in Africa uh, perform uh, some sort of self-mutilation, body modification, not necessarily self-mutilation, uh, body modification, mutilation uh, that happens uh, around funerary rites. Um, now, and we know about this because an African Bushman family was exhibited in Berlin in 1886. Now, this is a, this is a crazy, uh, s fairly disgusting thing that happened back in the 1800s and, and even earlier where uh, native peoples from other places would be brought to uh, Europe and later on even in America and they would be exhibited. Okay, like, oh my gosh, here's an African person, you know, like, oh look, you know, let's bring them to, you know, to, to Europe and exhibit them like a zoo animal. You know, this was something that was done uh, quite commonly, unfortunately. So it's incredibly racist. 
Um, and it's, uh, it's really, I think, quite disgusting, hopefully quite disgusting to us nowadays. And again, this has a lot to do with the history of racism in Europe. And if you were in the Nazi Germany class last uh, Wednesday, I gave a whole lecture on Nazi racial categories and racism in Europe and in America. Um, and that lecture will eventually be posted if anybody wants to watch it. I think it's worth watching, especially in this day and age. Because um, I don't think you guys learn much about racism in, in in, in, in many of your classes. Am I wrong about that? Are there classes where they're teaching a little bit about the history of racism? I learned it in my jazz class a lot. Jazz I class, that's that a good class to take, yeah. That's a good class to take, yeah. Um, so anyway, that, uh, that video will be online soon, and if you want to watch it, it's on YouTube, you'll be free to watch it. Anyway, that's a side thing, you know, um, but they found in this family they were looking at, they said four of the six family members had one or more fingertips amputated. And, um, and what happened, there's a couple things that went on. First of all, people would get sick, and to get some, it was, it was thought by some of these tribes that if you amputated off uh, like a fingertip or something, that would help with sickness. That was one thing they found. The other thing they found that was a little bit more um, widespread was that finger amputations also were connected with African tribal mourning. Okay? And the extent of the am amputation, how much of the finger was removed, would indicate the closeness of the amputee's relationship to the deceased. And so this is, this is what would happen if somebody dies in the family and to show your grief, to express your grief, you would cut off a fingertip or maybe more of your finger depending on how close you were to the person. And so they found some of this stuff. Uh, also, they found another custom from the Danny tribe. Um, this is um, a ritual that's performed in order to placate the ghosts of the slain, of people who were slain. Early in the morning, two or three young girls who are closely related to the dead person are brought to the funeral site and there with a sharp blow from a stone, uh, acts. Uh, each girl has two fingers chopped off. Virtually all Danny women had lost two to six fingers in this way. Okay. Anyway. Uh, and of course we also know uh, there's also a, a version of this uh, in Japan that if you join the Japanese organized crime, uh, uh, Japanese organized crime syndicate collectively known as the Yakuza, you guys know about the Yakuza, uh, and you are given an assignment and you go out and you screw it up, you don't do a good job or whatever, you come back and to express your, uh, your remorse to your boss or as something just as a punishment, you will have usually a tip of a finger or half a finger chopped off. So if you're in Japan and you're going on the train, you see a guy there and he's got half a finger, that's a Yakuza. Right? It doesn't matter how well he dressed he is, and if you could get him to take off his clothes, you probably see he's probably got a full, full suit body tattoo. And also indicates the person's a Yakuza. But they also do this sort of finger amputation thing, that's sort of uh, uh, something you do to, uh, to uh, you know, as an as, uh, act of uh, remorse for screwing up a job. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, self-mutilation in modern Europe, uh, sometimes associated with psychosis, and we're going to see this a lot. A lot of the self-mutilation that people do uh, can be associated with psychosis. 1888, uh, Vincent van Gogh, who was angry at the housemate, cut off his earlobe, his ear, and sent it to a prostitute named Rachel, who he did not have any relationship to. It wasn't like he was visiting her all the time or she was his girlfriend or anything. He just it was a prostitute he knew about. He sent his earlobe to her. Um, and the idea is he may have had some biblical delusions related to Rachel of the Bible, or maybe this is a way of getting attention or showing his love for her. We don't really know. Okay. Uh, we do know from looking at his paintings that possibly he may have, you know, been a little psychotic. We, you know, look at this, it looks like kind of uh, a lot of his paintings which are brilliant. Also may have a little aspect of psychosis to them. Uh, if we go further back in Europe, we'll find uh, other forms of self-mutilation. Again, this is another religious one uh, where people will flagellate themselves, they'll, they'll, they'll whip themselves um, as part of their uh, religion. It was practiced by flagellant Christian cults from the 11th century uh, on. And we also know that uh, Muslim groups, Muslim uh, sects will also practice self-flagellation. And there are flagellation cults still active today in Brazil and also in some Middle Eastern countries. Again, this is a modern picture from somewhere in the Middle East of these Muslim guys whipping themselves into a bloody frenzy. Okay, very common. Now, there's been some interesting studies done on whipping. I didn't put this in here. Um, they found that um, when people are whipping themselves, if they do it sort of in a group, like they can, you know, they're all doing it together, you know, that the rhythm of this, 
puts them sort of into like a trance state and they're more able to withstand the pain. So the rhythm of the whipping is very important in doing it with other people. So if you do it with other people and you do it in a sort of synchronized way, you can do more of it. And so this is why you'll see these guys doing more whipping, you know, like doing it in a group. And so they, you know, rather than just doing it sitting by themselves and doing it, they do it in a group because they can do more of it, right? Now what's the idea here with this? It's typical to what I've said about other things. I talked about this in my other class. The idea here is that you mortify the flesh to free the spirit. So again, the body, you know, especially in Christianity and Islam, the, the body is the source of sin, right? Your body, your lustful urges, you know, your greedy urges, all your bad things, the seven, the seven bad things, seven deadly sins, uh, you know, at least many of these, you know, emanate from the body. And so if you can control the body, you can get the body to a point where, you know, you have it under control, where you mortify the flesh, then you can free the spirit from these things, right? And so again, this is why we see this kind of stuff going on in, in, in religions. And not just Christianity, we'll talk about some other religions as well. Again, I talked to you already about Oedipus and modern psychology. Of course, you know, we have this form of self-mutilation from Oedipus. You know, could be related to genetic sexual attraction. Somebody ought to do their dissertation on this. Maybe I should just write a book. I don't know. Um, what about biological versions of self mutilization Are there any biological explanations? Well, we do have some idea about biological explanations about uh, self-mutilation. One is that there's been evidence uh, uh, that suggests the role of the neurotransmitter dopamine in self-mutilation. Again, you do oh, dopamine, dopamine, and also endogenous opioids. If you mutilate yourself, you hurt yourself, you, you, you release these uh, chemicals into the body, and that may feel good, and so people learn to associate those good feelings with these uh, painful acts, okay? uh, producing endorphins and, and dopamines. Okay? And this can reduce something like dysphoria. You know what dysphoria is, what dysphoria means? Dysphoria is where you generally just don't feel good. You go around all day, you just don't feel really good. Right? You just feel kind of mentally, you know, eh, I don't like life, life just sucks. But you can whip yourself, get some endorphins, and now you feel good again. Uh, the more modern way of doing this um, is to exercise. And again, now, you know, modern uh, research has shown that exercise is probably about as good a treatment for depression as drugs or psychotherapy. In fact, many therapists in L.A. now will not uh, treat you for depression unless you bring a note in from a personal trainer saying that you're in an exercise program because it's so powerful. And again, this may be why, because when you exercise, you release, re release endorphins and you feel good. Anybody here a runner? Anybody here a long-distance runner? So you know this. If you're a runner, you know, you know that first five, ten minutes is just literal hell and then you hit some sort of plateau and suddenly you start feeling really good and the running feels really good and by the time you've clipped off five or six miles you don't really want to stop because you're just feeling so good that's the endorphins kicking in dopamine kicking in right and so runners can become addicted to this and if they don't get a good run in they go around and they feel crabby and miserable and pissed off at everybody right i'm just kind of like bad mood you go get your run in come out now you're now you're now you're feeling good again right so this is true for other forms of exercise as well you know I would say for me, you know, if I don't get my karate practice in, you know, I will just be in a bad mood like all week. You know, I'm going around, you know, kind of pissed off, you know. And I think that's true for a lot of, a lot of different kinds of exercise. If you exercise regularly, you'll feel If you just do a little bit of exercise, you may not notice this, but if you do something where you're, you're exercising more intensely for a longer period, you will, you will notice this. Okay. Um, okay. Now, other individuals may mutilate themselves in order to supply some sort of sensory stimulation, and this can also be related to psychological conditions where you're not sure where you end and the rest of the world begins. Uh, but also, just to get some sensory stuff, just to feel something, people do this. This, this one a lot of times has some psychological um, component to it. Number four, uh, we see a stereotypical self-mutilation in some uh, actual medical syndromes. Uh, uh, for instance, Leshnaya syndrome, the Lange syndrome, the Tourette syndrome. And this spurred an interest in a biological model of this, and of course they're able to engineer these mice to have uh, Leshnaian syndrome, and to see this mouse has chewed its own leg off. And so people with Leshnaian will tend to uh, self-mutilate. And it's a very interesting syndrome. I had a couple of patients when I was in the, worked in the mental hospital that had Leshnaians, and it's very interesting. It's, a, uh, it's an X-linked recessive uh, gene, so that only males uh, typically suffer from this caused by a nearly complete absence of the enzyme HPRT, which results in extreme overproduction of uric acid and the related symptoms of gout and renal dysfunction. 
In addition, all the patients have some neurological abnormalities, including involuntary spastic movements, difficulty articulating words, and a unique compulsion to self-injure and abuse others. Sometimes they not only uh, will injure themselves, they'll also try to injure other people. And this can be both physically and verbally. Um, the symptoms are so severe that patients are unable to sit or stand without assistance. The muscles controlling vo vocal production are similarly affected. Speech can only be understood with great difficulty. The self-injury starts as young as two years of age with lip and finger biting being most typical. As they grow older, patients injure themselves in any way they can devise. Um, and this is the, why there's probably a heavy metal band called Lush 9. I don't know if they're still around, but they used to be around. Mm -hmm. uh, the first symptom of Lush 9 disease is orange sand in the diapers, which can occur with babies as young as one week. And this shows that this is basically an accumulation of uric acid. Uric acid is something your body produces naturally. Um, but if you have this uh, enzyme problem, you don't, you don't, you produce too much of it. And um, this can cause um, some problems and eventually it, it damages the kidneys. So back in the day, these kind of people used to die uh, pretty early from renal failure. Okay? Um, by three months, uh, developmental problems are noticeable. Uh, there's a limp baby, they can't lift their head. Six months, parents may no notice an unusual arching in the back. Nine months, they're unable to pull themselves in a standing position and they do not crawl. 12 months, they're not walking. By 18 months, they evidence involuntary movements that seem jerky and twisty, have odd posturing in the arms, legs, and torso. Okay. Children will begin to bite their fingers, lips, the inside of their mouths as early as two, two years of age. As they grow up, uh, the self-injury becomes more compulsive and severe. And eventually, they have to be mechanically restrained. Otherwise, they'll, uh, they'll, they'll hurt themselves by banging their head, gouging their nose, biting off their fingers. Uh, loss of vision from rubbing on their eyes, etc., etc., etc. By the time they become teenagers, they can become physically and verbally aggressive. Many of the patients will have their teeth extracted to eliminate danger caused by biting. Um, and so this is fairly, fairly severe stuff. Okay? They do not know exactly why um, the mechanism behind why the self-injury arises from this, from this overproduction of uric acid. They're not quite sure why this why this happens or what's going on in the brain because of this. At least when I, when I, when I was preparing this lecture, they didn't know, okay? Well, average life expectancy, mid, early to mid-20s. Uh, kidney failure was once the main cause of death, but there's now medication to control uric acid production. And you can take medication to lower your uric acid production so they can, they, can, they, can, they can mitigate the damage to the kidneys somewhat. So patients are living much longer now, okay? Now, this is the part that's the saddest, intellectually, these folks with Lesh Nyan are completely normal and normal intellectual capacity. And so I had Lesh Nyan patients in the hospital. They would do the severe stuff, but they're in a hospital. They've been institutionalized because the parents couldn't take care of them because their behavior is so severe. But they're institutionalized living in a hospital with you know, people who are profoundly uh, developmentally disabled. And this was very sad for these folks because they were, they were intellectually really quite capable. All right, let's talk more about religious uh, spiritual explanations. And I've kind of given the punchline away for this already. And by the way, this is an image uh, of uh, one of the Hindu goddesses, Kali. And this is a, a, a very interesting symbolic image. And if you take my Psych 344 class, which is psychology and Asian thought, where I go over and, and go into different uh, Asian religions. I think some of you guys may have taken this. Um, I will go into a lot of detail about the symbolism of, of these kind of images. A lot of these kind of images in Hinduism and in Tibetan Buddhism, uh, they're really very violent. This woman's head is chopped off and the blood is coming out and these guys are drinking the blood here. Um, while she is having full on sexual intercourse with this guy Shiva here in, 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 in corpse pose, right? Anybody here done yoga? What do you do at the end of yoga class? Shavasana, Shiva Asana, Shiva position, right? You just lie there, right? This is Shavasana. <laughs> now what you can't see in this picture very well, because it's a little blurry, is that he's in Shavasana, he's fully erect. <laughs> and she is having sex with him. So hopefully that doesn't ruin your next yoga class. When you do Shavasana, you're supposed to relax and to zone out and it feels so good because you've been exercising so hard in yoga. But the real Shavasana, 
has another component to it. Okay, and symbolic. It, it's not. It's not that the Hindus are being purient or you know they were just going to go out and have sex and you know whatever. No, this is symbolic. Okay, this is symbolic. This is the raising of the of the energy from the lower chakras to the higher chakras, if you want to put it in in simple terms. That's what this is representing here. Uh, but you'll see a lot of this kind of imagery in Hinduism, um, and again involving you know self mutilation in many cases. In this case, she's cut off her own head. Uh, but there's other self-mutilation we'll see in Hinduism. Uh, it's very quite common. Okay? Uh, so very, very interesting. Now, interestingly enough, what's really fascinating to me is that Hindu culture, especially modern Hindu culture, is really quite, really quite prude. Uh, that women in India, you know, are pretty much expected to cover up, you know, pretty well and, 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 and be very, very, uh, um, what's the word I want to use? Very uh, demure. You know, they, they, don't, they don't expose a lot of skin. You know, there, there's sort of proper ways to dress it. And again, you know, there's a lot of societal um, um, scandal, you know, when you have a Bollywood star and she suddenly comes out and she's shown in a bikini or something. You know, that'd be really, it's kind of be really scandalous. Now, of course, for younger people in India, this is because of the film industry and everything. Some of these mores, you know, are, 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 are loosening up a little bit. But in general, India is a pretty prude culture. It's a pretty buttoned down culture. And yet, if you go to the temple, you'll see these depictions of these kind of, you know, and you'll even see other depictions of sexual acts, like pretty graphic. So it's really quite fascinating, and the, the contrast between these two things. So uh, everybody should take my Psych 344 class if you get a chance. Uh, you get that multicultural C credit for it that you all need to graduate. Um, uh, people tell me they tend to like the class. It's quite interesting. You should learn a little bit about Asian culture, Asian religions, because of course, there's a lot of people in India and in China, and if you're ever going to, you know, get out of here and go into business and make money, you're probably going to interact with China and or India, um, probably. And so it, I, I, people tell me they find it very useful. So anyway, that's my shameless plug. By the way, I'll give you some other shameless plugs for classes. Uh, I, I'm still looking for people to take that class. I, I offer that 344 class in the summer online for the Galita students. But anybody can take it, so you guys are welcome to take that and get the credit for it. I also am offering on campus here in the second session the Foundations of Counseling class. It's like 370. And that's a class, if you're thinking about doing a clinical career, many of the counseling programs have that as a prerequisite. That you have to have taken that class as an undergraduate in order to get into the graduate programs. So I'm taking that, uh, that class now, it will be in the second session, it will be completely online. Another one I'm going to do online in the summer. So if you're thinking you need that class, you want to go into a clinical field, that's a good one to do. Um, it shouldn't be too terribly onerous. It just be a lot of reading the textbook and taking tests and that kind of thing. Um, I mention that because it's right now it's not doesn't have enough students. It's not going to go. They're going to cancel it if I don't get enough students. So I'm, I'm going to do a little. I'll probably next couple of weeks do more shameless plugs for these kind of things. So bear with me, um, kind of stuff. Okay. Also, the Nazi Germany class, we still have space in the summer if you want to register under history. We're still looking for about 10 more people to sign up and do Nazi Germany class in the summer. That's also going to be online. So if you have any interest in that stuff, if you're not going to be around uh, next spring semester um, when we offer it here on campus and or you want to just make sure you get it because it's hard to get into, uh, take, it, take it there and sign up under history. Don't sign up under psychology. I think psychology is full now. Okay, so sign up under history. It doesn't matter. It counts the same either way. Okay, sorry for the shameless plug. Should have done that in the beginning of class, sorry. I'll cut this out of the lecture. Okay, so let's think, talk, about, talk about Hindus and body modification. These are a group of Hindu uh, holy men known as sadhus. And these guys exemplify this idea of, um, of uh, mortifying the flesh to, uh, to free the spirit. So what this guy's doing here is his, his practice is holding his arm up. So anybody want to try this? Here, try this. Come on, you guys. Hold your arm up. Let's keep it up there. Just keep it up. Now we'll just keep talking. Now, uh, how long do you think this guy has been holding his arm up here? 16 years. Yeah. <laughs> a long time. A little more. Yeah. yeah. 20 years. Getting close. 25. Too much. 22. 21. He's been holding his arm up for 21 years. Now, anybody arm start to tingle a little bit? I'm an old man, so yeah. mine probably yeah. starting already. Yeah. Now, we've been doing this for about 15 seconds. So imagine if you were to do this for, you know, even a day. Can you imagine holding your arm up for a day like this? Yeah. All right, you can put your arm down now. 
Uh, imagine 21 years holding your arm. And you can see his arm is withered, his fingernails are growing into his hand, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So this, this is one of the things, kind of things the sadhus do. His teacher would give him this as his practice to do this. Okay? And this is his spiritual practice, mortifying the flesh to free the spirit. Right? Now this guy's thing is he's just surrounding himself by hot rocks, hot fiery rocks, and he's got fire on his head, and he's out in the sun in India where it's 120 degrees in the shade, and he's meditating. So that's his practice. Right, and then they get, then they get, then they get progressively uh, more interesting. My wife was, um, uh, when she was younger, was in India with her family, and she met a sadhu uh, who was uh, basically had a practice. His practice was every year he cut off another inch of his arm, and when she met him, he was about up to here. That was his practice. Um, I don't know what he's going to do when he gets here and he has to start on the other arm. That's going to be difficult. Um, but that was his practice. Another guy she met was a guy who stood all day and just stared with his eyes wide open at the sun. And interestingly enough, he could see perfectly well. Very interesting. So, so again, lots of different things. There's guys who stand. There's all sorts of different ones. Um, again, if you take the 344 class, I'll show you some other ones. Um, but I thought I'd show you, uh, this, guy, this guy is sticking himself in here, and upside down in head, doing yoga. Um, some of these guys, by the way, don't do real extreme things. I was in Nepal, and I met a bunch of these sadhus, and they just did yoga all day. And they were really good at yoga. I mean, they could do stuff like twisty pretzel stuff. They were and they were so friendly, like, oh, come and do yoga with us. They had the yoga mats for pieces of cardboard. They're completely dirty. They just live on the streets and just do yoga 24-7. Very cool, right? Um, now, this guy burying himself head in the sand, that's his thing. This guy's practice is really interesting. What he does is ties a load of bricks onto his penis and lifts them. And because this is the bizarre behavior class, I thought I would show you this. So here he is. Um, Hari Govinda Singh rubs earth on his penis, firmly ties a sling of cloth, stretches his legs and lifts the stones. It's a miracle his penis is not torn off. The scene recalls a change used in the past to weigh down the penis continuously, but this exercise is now occasionally done, and then for a minute or so. But this is his, this is his religious practice. Again, if you want to mortify the flesh, if you want to, you know, the, you want to, you want to control the sin of lustfulness, what better way than to tie bricks to your penis and carry them around, right? And do not try this at home. The <laughs> last thing I want is for somebody's parent or something to call the president and say, my kid took Vulcan's class and got the idea to lift things with his penis, and now his penis is torn off, and I'm blaming you, and the president will get off in arms, and guess what, and the newspapers will be called, and guess who's gonna get in trouble? Me. So you are not to do this. You are forbidden. Unless you go to India and decide you're gonna become a sadhu, and that's gonna be your life, and there's no way it's ever gonna get back to the president of the university, then you do whatever you want. But while you're here, do not do this. And do not say that I did it. All you guys are the witnesses, I said do not do this, okay? You got it on camera, thank you. I got it on camera too. Okay. There are a number of things. There's another guy who rolls his penis up in a thing, tucks it between his legs, ties a rope onto it, and then pulls like a heavy cart. I don't know if I, I didn't put that picture in this lecture. You got to take my other class for that picture. So, um, this is from a book. Uh, it's a really good book it's, uh, on sadhus. Excellent book. I highly recommend it. I'll talk more about sadhus in, in the 344 class. Okay. Other uh, practices, the uh, Hindu practices, uh, they like to pierce things. There are a number of these, they have these festivals, these melas, and what guys will do is they'll go into kind of a trance, and they'll take like a long like metal thing, and they'll jam it through their cheeks, in one, out the other, or they'll, they'll put hooks on their body, and then like hooks on their back, and then pull a big heavy sled with it, all sorts of stuff they do, and they kind of do this in a trance state. And I think I can show you a little of this. Let's see if this should come up. In Malaysia, but this is a Hindu festival. This is in Malaysia. Okay. So you couple of these things. This thing is hooked into it. This guy's pulling something. It goes hooks it to his back. Here we go. Putting the hooks in. Okay. 
I think I have some other examples here. You get a little idea of this. This guy's getting a, he's getting the metal thing put through his cheeks. So a lot of prep for him. Put him into a trance. The guy's yelling in his ear, he's distracting him from the pain. I would want them quick. I know they go very careful. There you go. Just give you an idea. I had a friend of mine who was an Indian guy from uh, Malaysia, and I was telling him about the stuff. I said, I don't believe they're actually really doing it. He goes, Oh no, it's really true. And I go, No, nah, it can't be real. And he pulled out his wallet and he started showing me pictures that he had gone to one and they put hooks in his back. And he dragged this thing in it. And he said, he said when they took the hooks out, it, it, there was no bleeding and it, it healed instantly. There was no scar. I, go, I don't believe you. And he took his shirt off and his back was completely normal. But I had, he had the pictures of him with the hooks in his back pulling these things. So who knows what's going on there. Um, but this is another thing. Again, mortify the flesh, free the spirit, right? Yes? How common is it to be a sadhu in India? Like, is it like Oh, he's the barber, he's the milkman, he's the sadhu for this area? Take my class and I will explain that to you. <laughs> yes. Take the class, I'll talk about that. Dr. Yeah. Like, you, as you were saying, so that was different though because he didn't practice it every day. So mm -hmm. what happens when these guys' yeah. skin rips and they yeah. can't practice this? Is so like this stuff is very interesting. They do this, they don't do this every day. They do it in the festivals. Oh, but okay. when they pull these things out, the skin... Heals so up. Heals. Yeah, and it's kind of like maybe, you know, at least a little mystically, magically heals up. Like, you know, and that's a weird thing about this. And I don't think, they, again, that's been well studied. But these are very common. And again, it's not just Hindus. You find this in other religions as well. But the Hindu ones are the ones where you can go and you can participate in this if you want. You go to Malaysia or wherever they're doing these things and, and do part of this. Again, I'm not recommending that you do that. Um, here's a standing Baba. His, his thing is just to stand. So he, he never sits down, and this, he just has a sling for his leg when he needs to rest. Here's an agori. Agoris are, um, these are, I'm going to talk more about the agoris when we get to the um, lecture on cannibalism, because they have some cannibalistic practices, but again, they are an extreme version of sadhus. So I'll talk a lot more about them later on. I won't, I won't go into them today. They're very interesting. This is a hajira. These are people who are... Um, either born or created to be intersexed. They are a caste in India, they're a group in India, and they typically go around uh, making money by begging. They're usually uh, male to female um, transsexuals, and they're either born this way, intersexed, or they may be uh, castrated as young uh, boys, and they go around making their money by begging and or being prostitutes. And so you will see them in India. A lot of times they will come up to you and they will bug you and keep bugging you until you give money to go away. That's the easiest way for them to make money. Uh, but they're around. They're a very interesting subgroup. We have more time. We could talk a lot more about them. I, I, um, I might mention them again when I talk about castration if we have time. They're very interesting. I don't know if I have time this semester. And they're quite fascinating. Here's another uh, sadhu. This is the typical sadhu you see. Notice he's, he's just got ash. He's just clothed mostly in ash. This ash is from a funeral pile. And again, what the ash symbolizes is the impermanence of life. And these guys may just wander around and just pray and not really have any special self-mutilation thing they do, or they might have some extreme practice that you saw, or they might have a practice like this, which some of you might be very attracted to. This is a guy who's actually, uh, his practice is just to smoke hash all day. But it's not like just getting high and having a good time. 
This guy, it's really a full-on practice, so he's doing this 24-7. So when I was in India, there were a bunch of French guys there, and they were going out and finding these sadhus who were smoking hash to hang out with them and smoke, and they could hang for a day, and then they just have to like stop because it was just too much. And these guys would just keep going on and on and on and on. French guys also got in a lot of trouble too, by the way, because you should not go to India or any other country, by the way, and do drugs. Uh, they do not treat drug, uh, the drug laws are a lot more severe, and they do not treat um, uh, prisoners very well. I was in Nepal, I was walking by on my way home to this hotel where I was staying on the street, and I was walking underneath the police station, and the police were upstairs torturing a guy who, was, uh, who they'd found with heroin. And they were literally torturing me. You could hear them. I mean, they were questioning me. Or, you know, it was a full degree. So you did not want to do drugs in other places. You know, I mean, don't do them here either, but definitely don't do them in other countries. You're really asking for trouble. Okay? India, Nepal have very strict drug laws. They don't care about these guys because they're Indian, they're sadhus. They don't give a crap about these guys. You're caught smoking hash, you're going to get in trouble. Okay? Let's talk about psychological explanations for self mutilation stuff. Um, or actually, we're going to get to psychological conversation, but I want to give a brief tour and talk about some other things that we're talking about with regard to self-mutilation and body modification. Some of the things that we are going to um, just, we should just have, know what we're talking about here. Uh, the first one I'd like to talk about, so I'm really interested in this, this subject, is uh, tattoos in general are, are really quite fascinating. And I want to talk a little bit about tattoos in general, but I thought I would start out by talking a little bit about criminal and prison tattoos because these are tattoos that have perhaps some of the most heavy symbolic meaning uh, in, uh, among people who are tattooed. Uh, and, and they have general meanings. In, in other words, these meanings, people are tattooing things in their body that convey a specific message to other people about who the person is and about how they might behave toward others. And so I think this is really interesting. And again, you know about, um, I'm sure you know from TV and stuff about prison tattoos and getting tattooed in prison is fairly common. And people get various kind of prison tattoos here in America. And that prisoners make their own tattoo guns. And this is an example of they use it. They use a cassette motor from, this is back in the day. It's a little dated because this is a cassette motor from a, a, a tape deck, right? A little portable tape deck. Uh, and they use a pin. They sharpen things up here. And they have some ink and they make their own ink from various substances, not a lot of stuff that you'd necessarily want to put into your body, but you're able to make some ink, connect it to a battery, and they have a little primitive tattoo gun, right? Uh, some prison tattoos can become quite elaborate, so they can use this very simple uh, device to make quite elaborate uh, tattoos with it. Um, here's an example of a guy who's heavily tattooed. Um, by the way, should you see this guy in a bar, I would recommend staying away from him. Uh, there is some evidence that the more tattoos you have and tattoos placed on the face are likely indicative, perhaps, of um, somebody with a psychopathic personality. So you may not want to hang out with this guy. Also, he's a skinhead Nazi, so um, that, there's that as well. Now, um, tattoos that are, now again, you can look at this guy, this is a, I believe this is an American guy, you can see the tattoo symbolism here is fairly straightforward, skinhead, swastika, that tells you really, you know, a lot that you need to know about this guy. Um, the other stuff, um, you know, there's some other stuff here, sometimes there's numbers. This guy has, I think this is, it's 5150, which is the code, the police code for a crazy person. Um, you know, put somebody on a 5150, you know, that means they're crazy, you're going to put them on a three-day hold. So he's saying, I'm crazy. Um, I don't know what the other one is, I can't quite make that out, but in the bottom of his chin it says fun. So you get an idea about this guy. But again, it's, you know, in, in, in the United States, symbolism isn't too, you know, we don't, it's not too deep. Let's put it that way, right? You know, kind of what you see is what you get. you got to go to other countries to really see the more intricate sort of uh, symbolism of tattooing in, in prisons. And my favorite place to look at this, where you see really elaborate prison tattoos and symbolism, is Russia. So Russian uh, uh, prison tattoos are a thing. Uh, there is a, a couple books, there's a whole series of books, I think it's three of them, I believe I have two of them, on Russian prison tattoos, documenting uh, prison tattoos and symbolism in Russian prisons. Russian prisons, by the way, um, how should I put this mildly? Not fun places to be, okay? Uh, especially back in the days of the gulags, you know, you, Russian prison, not where you want to be. Still not very fun places to be, 
Okay? Um, not that American prisons are any fun, but certainly Russian prisons are uh, going to be very um, uh, frightening and, and fairly dangerous. So here's a guy here. I like this guy, showing pictures of him. Um, also, the fact he's in Russia means he's not likely he's going to show up in my class one day and object to me showing pictures of him. So what do we have here on this guy? We have, uh, we have some various kinds of symbols here. So these are, these are some symbolism you find in Russian prison tattoos. Tigers sim signify an enforcer or a sign of an avenger. Uh, this is geared uh, many times toward uh, guards at the pr and prison authority figures. An eye, the lower corner of the groin or hip area, thus creating a face when the trousers are dropped, with the penis becoming a nose. This is somebody who's been humiliated or is a downcast person. In other words, in American prison parlance, this person has been made somebody's bitch. A spider on the web with a web on the neck can indicate a drug addiction, also mean the wearer is a thief. Spider is shown moving upwards, meaning the wearer is still an active criminal. Uh, a Nazi woman uh, is shown as a sign of rebellion against Russian prison authority. An eagle is a proud badge of a grand thief or a bandit. Snakes around the neck or shoulders, you see that here. Uh, this the, means that the wearer feels the Soviet Communist Party system still has a hold on them, adversely affecting their lives. A Madonna and child, you see here, this means a propensity for crime from an early age. And the writing, by the way, underneath the snakes here, on the right, it says, uh, this is over here, it says wife. Sorry, my things are in that batteries. This one is wife, and this one is uh, mother-in-law. Okay. And then the thing in the middle of this chest reads in Russian to each his own. Under the eyes, it says, full of love. <laughs> On the chin, it says, dangerous, will kill. So again, another guy, if you're in a, going to Moscow, or you're in a bar in Russia somewhere, and this guy saunters up, you know, maybe best just to amble on out of it. Now, women uh, in Russia also get tattoos, and women's tattoos are usually more devotional and ornamental, and they have common images such as flowers, birds, hearts, angels, and wreaths. They're far more frequently hidden from view and are not associated as much with the performance of criminal power. They're often autobiographical, recalling first experiences for sexual experience, marriages, debt, birth, things like that. So you have things like a cat. Cat is associated with characteristics needed by a thief, slyness, can also symbolize luck and caution. A butterfly trapped in a spider web, again, in, in, indicates drug addiction, active involvement. A rose means the word that wearer celebrated a teenage birthday in prison. Barbed wire wrapped around the rose may symbolize a ruined youth. CCCP, which is the Russian initials for the Soviet Union, uh, is a sign of quality drawn on the breast, the pubis, sexual organ, or other int intimate parts of the body. A woman in a cross wrapped in barbed wire can indicate oppression, subordination, or slavery of the individual. Now, I just put this one up because I like it. <laughs> and I think if I ever get a tattoo, um, I might get this one. <laughs> this is Stalin as a vampire surrounded by a wreath of skulls. I just think that is just very, so cool. Um, Stalin was a horrible guy, by the way, if you didn't know that. Historically, a horrible person. So this is actually a very good, accurate description of Stalin. Here's some more stuff here. You can see the palaces. You can see various things. A lot of times, religious. you'll see a lot of religious symbolism, uh, Russian prison tattoos, very elaborate uh, artwork. See here more of this, very elaborate. And this is done with a very primitive uh, tattoo thing. Okay. This is somebody, um, if you get this tattoo, this is forced on you, and this basically means you are now going to be um, probably fair game with regard to uh, sexual access by the other prisoners. So that is not a tattoo you want to have put on you in prison. Um, we can talk about tattoos in other cultures. Of course, I mentioned the Yakuza in Japan, and uh, many Yakuza guys get these full bodysuit tattoos, you know, like where they put it cuts off at the legs and the arms. So you can't really necessarily the person is tattooed because they're wearing a suit, you wouldn't see it, but underneath it, they'll have these full body tattoos. The tattooing in Japan is typically, or used to be done in a very traditional way with just tapping, with the ink, you know, just tapping in. And so they take, they're really long, they take really long time to, to create. Um, and they're really quite beautiful. And here's a better example of something. 
of a Yakuza tattoo, a full body tattoo. So, you know, and again, they use a lot of these sort of um, traditional Japanese figures, you know, like samurai figures or, uh, you know, kami or gods, you know, kind of, you know, kind of thing. They're really beautifully, exquisitely done. This woman has one. You don't see a lot of women Yakuza. This is a woman who was born into a Yakuza family. So her father was a, a very big Yakuza, um, uh, head of the Yakuza, and so she, um, you know, she got the, the, the traditional tattoo. And if you go to Japan, and you have, you know, a lot of Americans have tattoos, we don't think anything of it. Um, if you go to Japan, uh, and you have a tattoo of any sort, a lot of times they will not let you into the onsens. The onsens are the baths, the traditional baths where you go and you take your clothes off and you go sit in the hot tubs. And if you have a tattoo, they won't let you in. You have to go to the onsens that are owned by the Yakuza, right? And the Yakuza are probably not too happy about having Western tourists, you know, enter into their baths. And so it kind of puts you in a, between a rock and a hard place. There are more, um, there are more artistic tattoos being done in Japan now, but there's, there's really quite a, there's been quite a, uh, um, a stigma attached to them because of the Yakuza. That's changing a little bit. There, when I was in Tokyo last time, a couple tattoo parlors had opened up, and there were young people uh, who were getting tattoos. Um, but it's just starting in Japan. Um, still a problem. Now, you know, tattoos is very interesting. I should also mention, you know, tattoos are, are something that, you know, are very common here in our culture. And it's very interesting because a few years ago, maybe 10 years ago now, when I taught this class and when I had 100 plus students in here, um, I would ask people, how many people have tattoos? And about three quarters to 85% of the women would raise their hands. And about 50, 60% of the guys would raise their hands. And over the years, what's happened is that those numbers have decreased. The tattoos had a kind of uh, surge of popularity that has gone down uh, quite a bit. It's interesting. And then I would ask the women where they had the tattoos. And about 90% of the women who'd raised their hands saying they had a tattoo had a tattoo in the lower back. <laughs> very, it was very, very popular among college women. Very, very common. Um, and that is, that is changing. So I could ask the rhetorical question. Don't feel like you have to answer. How many people here have a tattoo? Okay. Yeah, so now it's, it's, yeah, you know, I mean, that's the fact that we have two guys, and then, but then again, it's mostly women. Of course, there's mostly women in the class. Uh, how many people here, if you don't answer if you don't want, how many people have a lower back tattoo? Right? So again, <laughs> that's gone down. In the past, that would have been almost, uh, you know, most of the women in the class. Really fascinating. And says so that has changed now. The, the, the culture changed. And I don't know if it's because of, um, you know, there was for a while, like, the, a lot of these tattoo TV shows are really popular. Uh, Miami Ink, that was the best one in my opinion. That was really good. LA Ink with Kat Von D. I drove by, actually, I was driving through LA the other week and I drove by her tattoo shop. I'd never seen where it was. It's kind of in this weird place out in the middle of kind of nowhere in between Hollywood and Beverly Hills. And I drove by and I was like, oh, that's where it is, you know, oh, yeah, that's cool. But, you know, it was not very crowded. <laughs> you know, it's like, you know, back in the day, oh, we were turning people away, you know, so many people because of the TV show. There was a big, giant billboard of Kat Von D there, and there's like nobody in the tattoo shop. So, like, I used to, I went there yeah. probably like eight years ago yeah. with my brother, and he wanted to get <coughs> portrait done, but there was just so many people there that yeah. there was no way for him to do it that day. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, tell them to go back now. I'd probably get in, probably walk in and get stuff done, you know. Yeah, it was not very, it didn't seem like there was many people there. So, you know, again, there's this kind of fad popular. When I was in college, the only people who had tattoo were, were bikers and, and people who were ex-military. Military, ex-military. Ex and so the bikers weren't in college. They were, they were there to sell college students drugs. And an ex, there was a couple, couple ex-military guys, kind of a couple ex-military guys, and they might have a tattoo in their arm or something. That was it. Nobody else had tattoos. It was really amazing. And it's just, culturally, this has really changed now. The acceptance of tattoo as an art form has really changed. Yes? My granddad happened when, when he was younger, and he was a military. Yeah. And his was done by some guy who made his own machine. Yeah. And he also had them as a gang. In his hands here. Yeah. But he was a miner, so it was a mining. Yeah. 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 It's so strange now to see like my parents and I and now my grandma's have a tattoo because in his time it was seen as like a taboo thing, like yeah. they were part of gangs. Yeah. Like now everybody has Yeah. 
Yeah. Yeah, that's right. That's right. And I think Deb talked to you guys about uh, gang tattoos. She talked yeah. about gangs a little bit and saw that, again, there's a symbol of identification as part of the gang. You know. Now, where's your family from? England. England. What part? Um, up north, like Leeds area. Oh, you're up here. I'm just interested to ask because I know part of my family are Welsh and they all came over here to be minors. You know. No, he was one of the bad. He was one, of, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's interesting. But that's what people, you know, you get, you know, maybe certain professions. In the U.S. Navy, it was very common. You join the Navy. You know, I had friends from high school, they joined the Navy. and It was almost like, you know, peer pressure. You got to get a tattoo and they get an anchor or something. You know, it was very common. Right? Yeah, ship or an anchor. Yeah, yeah, very common. But now it's everybody gets them, you know, it's just kind of, you know, nobody bats an eye about it. Even teenagers now are getting them, I mean, nobody bats an eye really. You know, it's really amazing. The, the cultural shift and acceptance of tattoos is really quite, quite rapid. Yes? Like, I know just in the U.S., the I mean, culture shift can be very different because I know here, I knew people out of high school, they would get tattoos, and in high school there was one or two people that would have tattoos and yeah. parents had to waiver. Yeah. But then over the summer one year, I went to visit my family in Hawaii, and there was like, oh, people get tattoos at like 12. Yeah. Like that's... Also because among Polynesian people, yeah, in Polynesian culture, it's been, it's like, it's oh, been it's a right long right. time in the Polynesian culture. In fact, that's where the word tattoo comes from, with the sound, it's onomatopoetic word of the sound. That they would use a traditional way of just driving the needle in, right? Yeah, and so you can get, you can get these traditional you know, uh, Polynesian tattoos. Of course, you've got to wonder if there's some cultural appropriation going on. So, you know, I don't know, I would, I personally, I would, I would, I would ask somebody, you know, before getting their their, 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 you know, their tribal tattoo done on me, I would find it, make sure that was okay with somebody before I would do that. That's just me. Uh, very common, very common. And so places where you traditionally have tattoos, Japan, but Japan, they've only been traditionally done by the Yakuza. Okay? So again, you can see these different, different things around the world about tattoos. Um, but here now, it's really become quite, quite popular. The one thing that, that makes me a little concerned is there's been some research recently, there's a paper came out recently, where they found that the tattoo ink can migrate to people's lymph nodes. And what's happening is the body is treating the tattoo ink as a foreign invader and is going and, and trying to remove it by bringing it to the lymph nodes. And so there was a case, a medical case, where a person had enlarged lymph nodes and they, they went, they're trying to figure out why, and they found that they were full of tattoo ink. So that's one thing that would make me a little bit cautious about it. I, I think if you have a small one, it's probably not a big deal. But um, I mean, we, know, we know that the tattoos are done you know, in, under uh, you know, you know, reusable needles and sterile needles and stuff like that. It doesn't seem to be too much danger from infection. But I would worry about immune system stuff. For me personally, that would, you know, I'd be a little worried about that. And there's some evidence about that. I don't think people have really, um, you know, the ink technology. I mean, I, I think you could make a tattoo that had ink that was, you know, degradable by the body in a safe way, and that maybe would only last a certain period of time, and maybe five years or something. And then, you know, there's all sorts of. I think technology. There's a lot of technology that can still uh, happen with tattoos. The other thing I'm talking about now is tattooing electrical circuits onto people, mm -hmm. and that's an interesting thing. So you want to open your door, or whatever. You just you have a tattoo. You walk in the door. Your door oh. opens automatically. Yeah. You know? They're also talking about implanting oh. chips. They're doing that now too, implanting chips. But they're talking about now actually doing it on the skin. So that's something that may show up in the future. You know, with tattoos, we'll have to see. Here's another tattoo. Again, you know, this is traditional. I don't think this guy's a yakuza, but I think this is a traditional sort of tattoo. And people get really extreme tattoos. There's people who get tattoos all over their bodies. Um, you know, there's some people that have, who've had every inch of their body tattooed. I didn't bring that picture in. I should have brought it in. There's a woman who's every inch of her body's been tattooed. And you find people like this out there. People really get into it. There are tattoo conventions you can go to. Um, people tend to, when they start getting them, if they get a lot of them, they tend to get more. That's something that we see that, you know, I don't say it's like an addiction, but it becomes a you know, it's a little bit of a compulsion to get more of the tattoos and people um, uh, start getting more of these. I'll talk a little bit more about the symbolism of tattoos, the psychological symbolism a little bit later on in the lecture. I'll be talking about piercings. Piercings are also very common. Uh, a lot of people get piercings. Uh, how many people here have one kind of piercing? The ear piercing, right? How many people? Most of the women have their ears pierced, right? Some guys have their ear pierced. My son, who's 16, just got his ear pierced. Thought it'd be cool. So he got a pierced ear, you know, he thinks it's cool, which is great. 
Um, so piercing, very common. Um, again, rhetorical question, nobody has to answer this. How many people have something pierced besides your ear? Okay, a couple people, brave people willing to raise their hand. Again, not uncommon. Not uncommon. It can be all sorts of things, belly button piercings, um, you get all sorts of different kinds of piercing, eyebrows, nose, um, uh, genitals, breasts, uh, nipples, uh, common areas. I won't ask whether you've, anybody's had those areas pierced, um, but you know, you'll find that out there. Okay, that, that's a, the piercing very common. Um, we have a piercing, we have a tattoo place up in Camarillo here up on Ventura Avenue. They do tattooing and they also do piercing. So we know there's a readily uh, available place for students to get these things done. If you want to have them, they can go up there. Uh, it's relatively close. Um, this is an interesting one. I thought uh, this is a guy, a couple guys who got their tongues tattooed and then had a tongue piercing. So tongue piercing is another thing that was very, very common for a while. Again, mostly among women. Uh, and it's now seemed to fall off in favor, at least wearing them in public all day long has fallen off in favor. I don't know, how many people here have tongue tattoo piercing? Nobody has a tongue tattoo. Okay, a couple people got a tongue piercing. Brave people willing to admit it. So, but that was very common. So again, that would have been a lot more of the people in the class. And are you guys wearing them all the time or just, just, just every now and then? Yeah. So it would, back in the day, I'd have students come to talk to me and they would be wearing their tongue piercings. That would be a, a typical thing, you know. So again, we're seeing at least the, the outward showing of that has is, is decreased quite a bit. And I don't know why that is. These guys are, this is nuts. Tongue piercing has got to really, or tongue tattooing has got to really hurt. So, also the inside of the lip. Yeah, the inside of the lip. I might have a picture of something like that. Yeah, it says "fuck you" or something. In there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, so let's talk about some other weirder ones because um, you guys have seen because of the media, you've seen all the kind of tattoos probably there are to see. Uh, here's a guy who has um, had his uh, pierced his uh, nose so his glasses will fit in there. So those of us who wear glasses can kind of see the benefit of this. On the other hand, you've got to ask yourself, why didn't you just get contacts or LASIK surgery? So I don't know. Okay. There's a guy. Uh, ear piercings become very elaborate. I remember at one point my sister had her entire ear pierced. She had probably like 15 piercings in her ear. I don't know. She lived in San Francisco. So you know, the nice thing about piercings, if you remove them, then the body heals up and you don't have to worry about them, unlike tattoos. First person getting a lip piercing, lower lip. That was also very common, the lip piercing. Very common. How many people have lip piercings? Yeah, that would also would have been, there would have been more people with that. Um, yeah. Here's a guy who's kind of gone a little nuts with piercings, uh, since like lots of them. The nose piercing is another one that was, that was, you saw quite a bit of. Um, but this one through the, the center of the nose, that one you don't see very often. You see a lot of the ones going through the nose. Not in the center of the nose. This guy's gone a little, perhaps, too far with this. Okay. <laughs> Through his mouth, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. um, and here's a guy who's um, who stretched his earlobes out and then be able to tie them up and then keep them together. So, again, with lots of piercing over the eyebrows and, again, lots of tattooing here going on. Um, okay. Uh, and again, we can talk about like um, so-called play piercings. These are temporary piercings. These happen uh, during usually some sort of uh, social gathering where people do uh, various body modifications. So this would just been done during the social things. It would not be permanent. It would be removed uh, typically after. There's another guy who, this guy's had a bunch of stuff done. He's had his nose worked on. I think he's trying to look like David Bowie from The Man Who Fell to Earth. You guys seen that movie? The Man Who Fell to Earth, a very good movie, David Boy. He's an alien, he comes down to Earth. So if you haven't seen that movie, it's another thing. I'm giving you all sorts of great things to do this weekend. You know, so David Bowie, The Man Who Fell to Earth. And this guy, but this guy added in a, uh, a nose piercing. Implants. This is something you don't see too often. There's people getting implants under the skin. Um, and this is now, this, this had a little surge of popularity for a while, but I don't see much of it among college students. Um, this guy's got implants under the forehead, so typically you'll see him in the forehead. You'll also see him in the arm sometime. Um, uh, traditionally, the implants were done uh, by men and put in the penis. And men would implant pearls in the penis. And then when their penis becomes hard, 
the pearls would, you know, stick up a little bit, and supposedly that would be something that would uh, enhance the partner's pleasure. So that's something that was a traditional implant thing that you found in some societies. Um, and I haven't, I haven't heard much of that going on uh, in modern world, but I'm sure it does happen. Here's the guy. Here's the David Bowie guy. So he's had imp a forehead implant, flattened his forehead. He's also had nose work and lip work done, and something with his eyes probably contacts. This is a performance artist whose name is Orlan. She's a French woman, and she uh, she does uh, she's an artist, and she does various kinds of arts. But one of the kind of arts she does, performance art that she does, is that she uh, would go in and have plastic surgery, and have various implants and other things put into her, and various plastic surgery procedures, and have the entire thing filmed. And while it was going on, she would be reading, you know, literature out loud, like poetry stuff out loud, and. Um, very interesting uh, stuff. I mean, this is really pushing the boundaries of, of what art is. And you can see a little bit, let's see if I have a little bit of a clip of her. I won't show a whole lot of this. It's just that this is an interview with her. Can I hold it up to you? Ça change beaucoup la situation. Et opérer de quelque chose de, du ventre, quelque chose de très important, on peut nous donner la morphine. Et parfois, ça n'arrive pas à calmer toutes les douleurs, mais tout de même, ça change beaucoup la situation. Et si j'avais souffert pendant les performances, je n'aurais pas pu lire de texte, je n'aurais pas pu faire des dessins avec mes doigts et mon sang, je n'aurais pas pu répondre à la transmission par satellite qui était au centre Georges Pompidou, qui était au centre Malpuyade à Toronto. Euh, je n'aurais rien pu faire parce que j'aurais souffert et j'aurais été concentré sur cette douleur. So this is her during the operation. Usually she's awake during these procedures as part of the art, the art form. Some have described Orlan as mad and anti-feminist. They even describe those two bumps on her forehead as demon horns. If you see me and you don't see me, and you say that it's a woman who has two bumps on her forehead, everyone will think that I'm a monster and that I'm a bizarre. Mais peut-être si on me voit, ça peut changer. Et si j'explique aussi pourquoi j'ai fait cela, cela peut changer. En fait, l'idée aussi, c'était d'apprendre. You get an idea. You can watch these interviews with her online. They're really quite interesting. And I think, and she did it. Her piece was filmed. This is her, which she looked at after one of the one of the pieces. And these are the these are the uh, the bumps that she had implanted in her head, which you can still see signs of those. And you can see this is a art piece she did, you can see a little bit of this. Et décevante, crever le sac de peau n'assure pas forcément bonne prise. On attrape le rien. Okay, we don't watch that stuff, we'll get to the good stuff here. Here she is going into voilà surgery. Voilà, sans défait, pour peu qu'on ne lui demande. Et même si personne ne lui demande, il se demande, lui, comment s'en débarrasser. Car Il veut changer de peau. Il est bien clair que le seul bien qu'il possède, mais je suis un blanc, une peau de femme, mais je suis un satellite. She's reading this stuff out loud while she's there prepping her. They're going to do some liposuction on her too, by the way. I won't show you too much of this, but you get the idea here. They're doing liposuction on her there. She's, and she's, she's filming all this stuff and then having it. Yeah, this is part of the art form. Anyway, you get the idea here. That just gives you a little bit. There's, I believe that there is a link. You can get the link to the whole, the whole film is on YouTube. It's like a, it's called Carnal Art or something. It's like an hour long. You watch the whole thing. It's, you know, it's a typical art piece. It's very disjointed and weird, you know. Uh, but anyway, that's another. You know, we're talking about implants. So she had a lot of implants. I'll talk a little more about plastic surgery later on. Um, we'll get to that. Okay. Uh, here's more implants. This is the arm implant. Uh, this guy had a watch implanted. Very good for telling time, right? 
Here's one of the guys with implants who you might recognize, Darth Maul from the Star Wars movie. He had some horns implanted there. Okay, or maybe maybe he's an alien. Maybe those are natural species. We don't know. But if you want to go for Halloween, get a Darth Maul thing. I'm sure there's guys who've made themselves over like Darth Maul now. Um, branding. Branding is something that's never been super popular, uh, but it's something that people do as a body modification. Uh, basically, they heat up something, they brand the skin, and it makes a permanent, make a permanent uh, scar on the skin. Um, here's an example of this. I can show you a little video of this, just because it's almost lunchtime. And, um, I like body modifications because they represent I don't know, wanting to rebel against what, and they actually used to cut themselves, they used to bathe it in these, but so it would be in once as well. So he's got a hot iron, go in the skin the there. reaction I probably had is design. from my mom when I was growing up, and she always said that I'd never find someone that would like me for any tattoos that I had. If I had any piercings or tattoos or anything like that, I would never get married. So anyway, there you go. Her mom told her not to do it, but she's doing it anyway. That must hurt like hell, but people are into it, so um, you find various things. Uh, also, there are there are um, tribal people you find in, I believe, in Southeast Asia and, and also in Africa that do uh, um, not branding but scarification. I'll show you some of that um, later on. Branding also has a has a negative connotation because, of course, sometimes slaves were branded. You know, it's property of their owners, and so again, you know, there's a there's some cultural differences of how these things are viewed. Okay. Stapling, don't see this much, um, but there are people who staple themselves. Uh, here's another one. This looks a little infected to me, so I don't recommend this. By the way, none of this at home. None of the, I didn't tell you to do any of this stuff. Okay. Cutting. Again, we know a lot of people have cuttings. Uh, do cutting. A lot of people. This may be a sign of a, um, a mental disorder. Uh, especially personality disorder. We know that people with some kind of personality disorders like borderline personality sometimes will cut themselves or burn themselves. Um, so again, this is something that we see that comes from a psychological thing. And I'll talk about this in a minute, but that could also be because it lets them know where their boundaries are, their body. So we see these kind of things sometimes happening. But we also see cutting and scarification happening in traditional ways. So again, um, you see this again, I mentioned African tribes. A lot of people with African descent uh, get keloid scars, which means the scars um, are, are, um, are, are become raised up, okay? And so again, not, not all African people, but some, sometimes non-African people as well, but African people, uh, this is pretty typical. So you see she's got the sort of typical keloid scars here. This guy does too, and she just seems like a really happy person. <laughs> sort of like go hang out with her. She seems like really cool, you know, I don't know. I like that picture. Okay, we also see this in uh, Aborigines in, uh, in, um, in uh, Southeast Asia. I see some of this stuff um, done. So this is also something that you find in different parts of the world. In this sort of thing. <coughs> and again, this is done, uh, you know, a lot of this is thought to be uh, enhance the beauty of the person. Yes? How would you get scars like that that are raised up? You have to have the genetic thing to have keloid. Uh, Your body makes keloid scars. Oh, okay. okay. Um, so here's a woman, this is, I believe she's Hmong from uh, Southeast Asia, and she's got um, implants in the nose going on here. So again, the idea that this is a traditional thing. And then I thought I'd show you a little video clip of the person who claims to be the most modified transsexual person in the world. We're going to talk about a little bit about transsexual people later on, but I thought I would just show you a little video clip of this person. American Public University Sorry. has allowed me to dedicate my life to helping others. One of the beauties of... I am presently the most modified transsexual in the world. I have eight horns on my forehead. I have had my ears removed. My nose reshaped. Most of my teeth removed. I've had the, the white part, the sclera of my eyeballs, permanently stained green. I've had my tongue bifurcated. My whole face is tattooed. And I have had some scarifications in my chin and branding on my chest and on my wrist. My transformation is for me the greatest journey of my life. Okay. This, the Western Diamondback Rattlesnake, it is a 
uh, a tribute, a dedication. Sure, I'll let you guys, you can watch this on your own, but anyway, she is, she is uh, quite modified there. I'll give you a little bit of a kind of a summary of all the things, a lot of things we've been talking about. Um, okay. And again, not all these things are permanent. There's people who get together, so-called modern primitives, get together in a ritualistic way, do body modifications, such as those things I showed you, the, the piercings and other things here. Um, and they do this in a ritual way. Um, I can show you a little bit of this. respectable as time went on and we went into the 80s. These are all done as uh, early, performances. Uh, late 1970s, I had written a number of articles in a magazine called yeah. PFIQ. Don't worry, we're going to get to the penis stuff in a minute, so just hold on to that. And the only word I could think of to describe this was modern primitives. We're modern people, but we had a longing for an urge to do primitive things. So they, they adapt various rituals. Um, for instance, the Sundance ritual, which comes from Native Americans, where uh, young men would be hanging by by uh, hooks, uh, you know, and then they would basically have a vision, and then you know that would help them with their vision quest or they're doing. So again, the idea that they've appropriated some of these cultural ways of doing these things, and sorry, um, at this point in time, which is a, a magazine called Body Play. And people again doing this in public as they're kind of making rituals for themselves. And uh, this whole idea of attaching the idea to piercing and dancing to X. So again, people doing this, you know, probably this has to do with endorphins, with uh, you know, dopamine, you know, these kind of things. People are getting a, a high from doing this. Um, Here's a typical kind of a thing you'd see, somebody hanging by the skin. And again, how can they do this without ripping their skin off? You've got to remember your basic physics here, that the force is now being distributed among all these things, right? Not, not, that's why you can lay in a bed of nails, right? Because it's not one single nail, the force is distributed over all of them. So people will do this stuff and they will, they'll put hooks through their body and, and hang up here and do these kinds of things. And again, you can see a little more video here. This person doing body suspension, you'll see various versions of this. She's just hanging by the wrists. Hanging by the knees. Hanging by lots of points in the body. But again, remember, things are getting distributed here, right? So it's not as bad as just hanging by your arms. So if you want to do this stuff, you can find people who are doing this, right? By the way, uh, notice this. I, I didn't talk about the eye tattooing. That's another thing that's uh, been going on. I think we need to have a slide about that. Uh, people who tattoo the whites of their eyes. That's something that started as a prison tattoo thing. And now you're seeing people doing it. It's very hard to get a legitimate tattoo artist to actually do it because it's so dangerous. Um, but people are doing that now, and it looks really frightening. So you'll see some of that out there. Here are these women. What they are doing, you can't see really well, but they're putting, uh, they're putting hypodermic needles in her arm, down, down her arm, uh, uh, down the length of her arm here. Again, it's a temporary thing going on. Now, what's, what really strikes me about this picture is not the, not the hypodermic needles going through the arm, but the idea of it reiterates something uh, that I really, uh, a thing in the world that I really love, and it's just the, one of the greatest things in the world, and that is duct tape. And that you could actually use duct tape to create a whole outfit here. She's wearing a duct tape outfit. Or you can just use it to cover your nipples. And there you go, you know, I mean, duct tape, it's great. You know, it's, you can use it for everything. So, again, I, this, is, this just reiterates my love of duct tape here. Well, who needs clothes? Just need a couple rolls and you're good to go. Okay, let's get to penis uh, things, extreme body modifications. People like to modify their body parts. Sorry, I know it's almost lunchtime. Um, but here's a guy who has tattooed his groin area, including his penis and scrotum. And he has had, um, he has had his penis uh, somewhat bifurcated. Okay, so this again is supposedly a traditional type of body modification that comes from 
um, from uh, South, Southeast Asia. And the idea here is the penis, when it becomes erect, will kind of flower out. And the idea is that this is supposed to give women more, uh, more pleasure, give the woman partner more pleasure. Okay? Uh, you also notice he has a huge piercing through the scrotum. Scrotum piercings are also something that has been done in certain cultures. Arabic cultures uh, have a tradition of uh, scrotum piercings, not like this, a huge one like this, smaller ones. And so again, you'll see the genitals are things that are often pierced. And it just goes on and on and on. So this guy's got a lot of his penis and scrotum pierced. By the way, you'll also, I should have put pictures of women in here too. Uh, women will have their genitals pierced as well. And then we also have a body modification that involves actually amputating pieces of the body, cutting off pieces of the body. And so here you see this person has amputated part of their finger, part of their toes. Sometimes this sort of thing is done as a, and, and also some of the um, penis stuff is done to get erotic thrills from the person. That actually undergoing the body modification gives some sort of sexual uh, jollies to the person to get some sort of sexual thrill, which seems a little odd, but apparently this is what people are talking about. Yes? At this point, could it be labeled as Munchausen? Uh, you know, they're, no, not really, because they're not really seeking attention from medical professionals. If they were doing it, if I, you know, if, if it, could it be similar to a podaminophilia, where the person felt like that toe or that finger didn't belong, or, you know, and then by chopping it off, I get a rush, and that turns into some sort of sexual excitement. Maybe the lines blur at some point. Okay. And again, where I Dr. Phil and running some of these shows, I might get some people on who described cutting off something and getting a sexual thrill out of it. Because um, people have reported that. So, but the idea that it's alien to me and I'm going to get rid of it, you know, there could be some blurring gray area in these areas. And again, this is another thing that would be great to do for a doctoral dissertation. Really good thing to study. You get to go hang out at some of these rituals and watch these people and talk to them. It'd be a fascinating dissertation. I would love to be on that dissertation. Mm -hmm. Okay. Let's go back to psychology now. <laughs> so let's talk about Carl Minninger. Carl Minninger was a psychoanalyst who started the Minninger Clinic in Kansas, uh, very famous, and he wrote a very good book, uh, basic book on psychoanalysis. And in 1938, he suggested that self-mutilation might be an effort to heal oneself. And he, and he made this quote, local self-destruction is a form of partial suicide in order to avert a total suicide. Okay? And Minninger also classified self-mutilation behavior into four categories, neurotic, psychotic, organic, and religious. We talked about religious, we talked about organic, meaning biological. Um, we could talk about neurotic and psychotic now. At what point did the person become delusional and then do something to themselves? And what is the neurotic stuff? The neurotic stuff is you're just doing this uh, some sort of uh, pattern to, uh, you know, some sort of unconscious pattern that you're trying to either recreate or get mastery over, or you're, you're, you're basically fairly normal. And so maybe artistic expression could be something that would be considered to be neurotic, right? Because we're all neurotic to some degree, according to Freud. Okay. Now, uh, there's a paper, Self-Mutilation and Contagion. Um, and they looked at a bunch of adolescents. I mentioned this in the, in the exam too. And that they, uh, I think you guys, uh, maybe you're supposed to read this as well. And basically that, you know, if you put a bunch of people doing, you know, somebody doing self-mutilation into a group of other disturbed adolescents, then they, it can become contagious. Psychological explanations, self-mutilation often associated with personality disorders like borderline personality disorder. And which is that, you know, personality disorders, as I told you before, is often associated with sexual emotion or physical abuse. And so again, um, you know, we see if you're in the clinic and you're working in a clinic and somebody starts doing cutting or some kind of self-mutilating behavior, um, then that may be a sign that there could be some personality disturbances. And not necessarily all time, but, but it, 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 it could be an indicator. And that's something you'd want to look into. I had a roommate in college. And the thing he liked to do is take cigarettes and put themselves out on them. And I don't know if he did that because he was personality disordered, which was a possibility, or if he did it just because he got a lot of attention. But you, know, you may know people like that. Uh, from Patterson and Cahan, 1983, um, they talk about several distinct classes of self-destructive paper, and they describe the clinical characteristics of one class, the deliberate self-harm syndrome. Analysis of 56 published case reports of self-harm revealed the typical pattern of onset in late adolescence, 
multiple recurrent episodes, low lethality. Okay, so people who are doing sort of body modification, self-harm kinds of things, usually aren't killing themselves. Usually they don't die from these kind of things. A harm deliberately inflicted on the body, an extension of the behavior over many years. The clinical characteristics of the deliberate self-harm syndrome differ substantially from those of other classes of self-destructive behavior. And they were proposing that this become a separate uh, class in the DSM. I don't think it, 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 it ever became that. But you can see here some of the um, things here. Uh, signs and symptoms, intolerable emotion or despair, cognitive constriction, anxiety, of course anxiety, anger, you know, family disruption, etc., etc., etc. So lots of things that, you know, would make a lot of sense to be related to the deliberate self-harm syndrome. The other thing they did, this is very interesting, is they differentiate deliberate self-harm from suicidal behavior. This is important for clinicians, because if you're in a clinic, and somebody's self-harming, you need to know, was that a suicide attempt or was that this deliberate self-harm kind of thing? Because deliberate self-harm, low lethality, right? They're not going to probably kill themselves. Suicidal behavior, yeah, they could kill themselves. And so they, they, they have a whole list of symptoms here. Here's what the deliberate self-harm is and here's the suicidal behavior. Deliberate self-harm, more frequent in young, young people. Suicidal behavior, more frequent after age 45. Deliberate self-harm, equally frequent in both sexes. Suicidal behavior, completed suicide, more frequent among males. You know, on, 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 down the line here, okay? So that's, this is, this would be sort of how you differentiate if you saw some harm behavior. And you can look at here too, this is interesting, where you have you know, suicidality, high lethality, suicide attempt, okay? And direct, indirect, so maybe, you know, high lethality, direct would be suicide, and you try to shoot yourself. Uh, indirect would be maybe you, uh, you know, get drunk and, and drive really fast. Mm -hmm. uh, or you go, go for medical treatment that you know is, you know, might be life-threatening. And then you have here low lethality and deliberate self-harm syndrome. And direct would be just cutting yourself. Indirect might be chronically drinking, uh, you know, cigarette smoking, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. I'm very interested in this one, indirect, low lethality, delivered self-harm syndrome by rock musicians. I think this is something you commonly find among rock musicians here. So I'd be interested to know more about that. But that would be a great doctoral dissertation to do. You know. Isn't that true of like all artists though? All, a lot of artists, they yeah. They towards self Yeah, since I'm a musician, I focus on musicians. But yeah, you could look at other artists. It'd be a very interesting thing to look at. Let's talk about some other stuff. Um, let's ask the question, could self-mutilation or body modification also serve a psychological purpose of supporting or establishing a person's identity or group identity? And I think the answer to that is yes. And um, you might have got a little bit of an idea of that talking with uh, Deb Rubright who came in and spoke to you about gang affiliation, how many people in gangs have identifying tattoos. Uh, here's an example of this guy, you know, his tattoo, he's got the swastika and the SS runes, and it says Aryan Brotherhood, and it says something like white power on the top, you know, pretty much tells you what this guy's identity is, right? It also psychologically may be telling himself what his identity is, okay? Maybe, you know, this may be reinforcing his own identity, especially for somebody who may have a, uh, a personality disorder level uh, issue where they're not really, where their identity is a little fragmented or confused, like somebody with maybe with borderline personality disorder, they have identity issues, and also other personality disorders as well. The tattoo, the, the, the body modification may serve to, to sort of like help them uh, be less fragmented with, with regard to their identity, know, help them know who they are. You know, they're not quite sure psychologically, you know, well, they've got this tattoo on them that reminds them. Also, you could go to another level with this, and you could say, does the body modification let the person know that they exist? Or does it mark, like, let them know where they exist and the rest of the world begins, where they're separate from the rest of the world? This is another thing we see in, 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 in tattoos and other body modification, that you know, if we talk about somebody with borderline personality disorder, the skin is actually the physical border between you and the outside world. And so symbolically, if you're having problems with identity, then knowing where that symbolic border is can kind of reinforce the idea that you, know, that you have your own identity and maybe you know, help keep the fragmentation down a little bit. So these are very interesting things. And these are all ideas that 
we could explore a lot more um, if we had time. You know, if we had uh, time, I, I've been keeping meaning to do a paper on tattoos and the psychological um, implications of tattoos for a long time, and I, I probably missed my uh, chance. You know, when there was a peak of interest in tattoos, especially among young people, uh, when all these shows were on TV and everything. Um, probably should have done it then, but it, I, I've been thinking about it for quite a long time and it's really quite fascinating. Now, does that mean because you have a tattoo, you have some sort of personality disorder? And the answer to that is absolutely not. Uh, that, that tattoos also can serve some sort of pro-social, uh, positive psychology uh, things as well. Okay, And we should, we should mention those things. Um, and when you watch uh, tattoo shows like I do, like uh, you know, quite a bit, um, and you read some of the literature, you'll see that there also is, is um, there are also other more pro-social uh, dimensions to uh, tattoos. Okay, and one of those things might be helping you regulate your emotions, especially if you have some sort of psychological illness. You know, maybe borderline personality disorder, or whatever, or some some other it, disorder, and maybe having the tattoo helps you self-regulate your emotions. You know, that's fine. That's not a bad thing. Okay, but we see other things. We see uh, in tattoos. We see parental inscriptions. In other words, if you're a, a psychoanalytically minded person like me, you understand development as the internalization of mental representations, beginning with your parents. And these are what form your, uh, to some degree, your value system, what you believe is right or wrong. Remember, we'll go back to Freud and the superego. Uh, and so one way that tattoos uh, can serve a function is they can serve as a, a reminder or a, a physical inscription of these uh, mental representations of the parents. And so again, this can, be, this can be a positive thing, right? Your parents have great influence over to you. Um, there can be a relationship to suffering and pain. These can memorialize, you know, having made it through a period of suffering. This is another thing you see in tattoos. You know, I was in a bad car accident, I got all messed up, but I recovered from it, and so I got a tattoo, right? Uh, I, I had cancer, you know, I went through th surgery and chemotherapy, and I got through it, and, you know, I got this tattoo to memorialize, you know, that I made it through. And it reminds me, when I start feeling down again, or I start worrying about getting a relapse, or whatever, I can look at the tattoo and say, you know, myself, you know, wow, I'm really tough. I made it through. Like it can serve as a reminder for that kind of thing. Okay, so that's another thing you see uh, with tattoos quite a bit, okay, which could be perfectly healthy. Uh, another thing you see is uh, rebellion, form of rebellion. I am uh, now 60 years old. Uh, I do not have a tattoo because if I got a tattoo today at 60 years old, my 80 plus year old mother uh, would not be happy. <laughs> and so if she pisses me off and I want to rebel against her, I will go get a tattoo, right? And so it is a form of uh, rebellion, right? You know, getting a tattoo can be a form of rebellion, you know? This is, by the way, how I know my kid won't get a tattoo. Because he says, Dad, I think I'm not getting a tattoo. I'm like, that's cool. And maybe I'll go down and get one with you, right? Puh, buzz kill, <laughs> right? Anybody here got a tattoo with your mom or dad, went down and got a tattoo with your mom? I know actually people do do that. Because the parental inscription thing may be really strong. You maybe really want to really, really have a close bond with your parent. You want to memorialize that. But for most people, the rebellion stuff, getting a tattoo, you know, to some degree you want to shock your parents. Or you at least want to do something that, that, uh, that they're not going to do, right? So my kid went out, my 16-year-old kid went out the other day, and he got, um, he got an earring. He thought that was the coolest thing. I said, man, that's really cool. I'm going to get one. He's like, you cannot get one. He just told me, you cannot get one. You are, you are not allowed to get a, a, an earring. I'm like, oh, that looks really cool. I want to get one. No. You know. So, I mean, you know, that's the thing. He wants to be, he wants to be something that um, is somewhat rebellious. And, and this rebelliousness probably comes from a psychological place, a normal psychological developmental um, uh, period of when people want to individuate. They want to become their own person. They have their parental inscriptions. They have their, their the mental representations of their parents that help them in their development. But now they're at a point in their life where they want to become their own person. We call this individuation. They want to individuate. 
And so one way of individuating is some rebellion, you know, from your parents, from your culture, from your society, from, you know, whatever's given to you. And this is really quite normal and, 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 and really quite healthy to some degree. Sometimes I worry about your guys' generation. No offense or anything, but I see a little bit of a lack of rebellion. You know, I see concern about getting a job and, you know, how am I going to like it? Because you, know, you are, it's not your fault, you're graduating from college in a much different time than, than, yeah. than people yeah. previously. You know, you have different worries going on. Um, but, you know, back in my day, you know, there, when, you know the college campuses were a hotbed of, of, of rebellion. Right? I, th I think I told you the story when I was a kid and, you know, I was about 10 years old and there was a riot going on at Stanford University and the cops were here and the National Guard were called out with guns and, and they had the students over here, Stanford students, I mean, they're rich, you know, and they still cost a lot of money to go to Stanford back in the day. But there they were rebelling and they were about to have this riot, right, in this, in the, in the, it was start taking place in a parking lot near the campus and um, my friend said to me, 10 years old, time we were watching this, we were freaked out, right? And my friend said to me, I dare you to ride your bike down the middle of them. <laughs> <laughs> and being 10 years old, you know, and being stupid, like, and it's a dare, you know, you can't turn out a dare. So I just rode my bike, I got up a bunch of speed, rode right down the middle of them, before, right before they started, like, fighting. And then, they, then the clash came and they were, you know, beating him over the head and spraying with tear gas. But I, I right the minute beforehand, it's like my greatest deer of my life I ever, I never had to do another deer after that. That was the greatest deer of my life. Um, but so, but back in the day, students rebelled, that's my point. Um, and, you know, they had things to rebel about. You know, they had the Vietnam War, et cetera, um, which was the big, big uh, cause that they were rebelling about. But other things as well. And you guys certainly have plenty of things that you could be uh, worried about, but I worry that your generation has been sort of downtrodden, you know, and so it's sort of squozing all the rebellion out of you. I don't know. Maybe I'm wrong. Hopefully I'm wrong. Yes? So what would be the, like, in your opinion, the, I don't want to say downfall, but the bad reason about not having rebellion? Well, it's, it's not, there's no bad reason to not have, you know, fine not to have any rebellion. Um, I mean, again, this is just my opinion, so take it with a grain of salt. But I would think were I a young person graduating from college today, that there are a lot of things that I'd be pretty upset about. Student loans. How many of you guys are all going to be in debt when you graduate? It's a good chunk of people, right? Um, you know, it's, I would be pissed off, you know. I mean, I think there's plenty of things that are... Worrisome. I worry that there's so many things that you just that, that people just sort of give up. And I hear this sometimes from our graduates. By the way, this is one of the reasons also I twist people's arm to go to graduate school. Because I still think that's a that's a decent way out of some of the problems that you're gonna have when you just graduate here. My opinion. Okay. But I, I also think that there's a there's there's a healthy I think it's healthy to individuate. Now, you, there's other ways to individuate besides rebellion. Back in the old days, what you would do if you were a Native American, you would go on a vision quest. You'd go out and basically fast out into the woods, and maybe you'd hang yourself up by those hooks and, until you had a vision, and then you wouldn't come back until you'd had your vision. You'd seen your vision, you know, and, and that was a way also of individuating. When you came back, you know, if you were a, a boy, you would go out to do this, you'd become a man, right? And females had their own... Uh, you know, had other ways, you know, they would individuate. And so again, I, I worry in our culture that we are losing some of these uh, rites of passage to individuation. Uh, back when I was a kid, you know, the big rite of passage, you turn 16, you get your license, right? Now I see young people, people younger than you, like my son's age, you know, they turn 16 and I don't really care. You know, because they got helicopter parents who drive them around everywhere. You know, it's too expensive to get to get insurance for a car. Um, I mean, the car itself isn't that bad, but the, the insurance is, is crazy expensive, right? Too expensive, and so kids don't have. There's there's another rite of passage they don't have anymore. And so, you know, I think those are healthy things, and I think um, I think these are things you see in lots of traditional societies, and I, I I worry that you guys are losing some of those. Now, you guys are college students, so one thing in college going to college and graduating from college is getting into college, going to college, graduating from college, all those are rites of passage. And I think that's one of the primary ones we still have um, in our society. And so congratulations to all of you for participating in that. What we find, and my, my, my psychologist, my TV psychologist friend Wendy Walsh talks about this, is that we're seeing now that young men 
are no longer participating in this rite of passage. It, it huge numbers, huge numbers. So again, kudos to the, the, the males in the class. Um, you guys are going to be um, in the minority of males in your generation that you'll actually have a college degree. Uh, we're seeing now far fewer men going to college, young men going to college, and more women going to college. So kudos to you ladies, you know, you're picking up the slack here by going to college in greater numbers, but the guys are not. So Wendy thinks that this is what, that, that women are going to take over society. This is how it's going to happen. The men are going to be home in their parents' basement playing video games while you guys are all going to college and becoming engineers and doctors and psychologists and you know, everything else. So, um, you know, that's, so I worry about, especially about young men having rites of passage. I mean, women, ha I think women also, you know, more rites of passage, great for women too, but at least you still have the college one left. The guys, that one seems a little bit of concerning. Yes? Um, in my experience with the circle that I know of guys that haven't gone to college, yeah. they don't feel that it's necessary now to get a degree because they think that degrees are like, they even equate them to like a high school diploma. Yeah, yeah. Yet the research is really quite clear. The higher you go up in education, the more money you'll make over your lifetime. There are some people who disagree with that and think like, oh, you don't really need a college degree. I would say if you are going into a trade, you're going to go, you know, uh, join the plumbers union as an apprentice out of high school and learn to be a plumber and go up through the, you know, become a journeyman, you know, do a trade. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, it's fine. You don't need college. I have a friend. He, he works as a longshoreman. He started out on whatever their apprentice program, longshoreman. Now he's worked his way up. It takes a long time. But he makes more money than I do. He doesn't have a college degree. I mean, I think it's fine. If you're going into a trade, that's fine. Trades or trade education, going into trade is very undervalued in our, in our culture, uh, in a status way. Uh, trades, you know, like they have a lot lower. So, oh, yeah, I'm just a plumber. Well, you know, you know uh, you're not a college professor like me. I'm really important. I'm a college professor. Well, I'm a plumber. I make twice as much money as you college professor, you know. I mean, so you can do really quite well in a trade. But when we're talking about, you know, uh, but a lot of times, to get into a trade, the way to do that now is to go to community college. That's generally where most people get into the trades. They go to community college and they at least start learning their trade. They get into apprenticeship programs, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So I would say young men doing that, that's fine. But again, what we're seeing is a lot of young men not really doing anything. They just I have a high school promo, I'm just going to get a job. You know, do you want fries with your burger? You know, I mean, that kind of thing. And that is a concern to me. You know, I think going into a trade is great, and I would actually, if I were, if you guys were all in high school, I would be encouraging you, some of you, to think about going into a trade. Okay, very important. Yes. Yeah, I know for with my group of friends, like going back to high school, a lot of the guys were, if they went to college, like most of the people I know that are in college are girls, and like, I know one of my guy friends is also in college for like academics, and yeah. everybody else got into sports and they're either not in there anymore or they're like this is too tough and they drop out. And yeah. you know, some people have joined the military. Like, I know yeah. for the guys the military yeah. is a very gleaming and glamorous option, but when I talk to them again they're yeah. just like I yeah. And again, nothing wrong with going to the military because going to the military, if you go in, you are in some way going to, usually in some way, shape, or form, you're probably going to go to school to learn something. Yeah. And then when you get out, you get your school paid for, which is great if you want to go to college. So that's a good option, too. They were all expecting, like, oh, I'm going to go to like, fight for my country. Yeah. yeah. in like, Arizona for yeah. four years, and they're like, I. This yeah. is not what I was expecting. I was well, that's the one thing about the military. Once, once you yeah, join the military, you got to pretty much go where they tell you to go, right? 10% yeah, fight. 10% yeah. of the military fight. The rest of the military just supports yeah. the 10%. Yeah. Wow. So, you know, and there's less, you know, soldiers being sent overseas now. And, mm -hmm. you know, but, yeah, I mean, you know, th these are all options. But, I'm just, but, you know, the research is very clear. The more, you, you know, the more education you have, the better you do financially. So it's, and especially graduate school, by the way. So graduate school, if you go to graduate school, you will do better financially. Um, you know, on average, people do better. So just, again, I'll twist your arm to go to graduate school. That's my job, so I'm going to do it. Okay. So all this has, what does this have to do with body modification? Well, again, body modifications can be a rite of passage of some sort, you know. So maybe I didn't go to college, but I went and got, I went and got a piercing, you know. And now I feel like, you know, I'm, I'm a man, you know. So, so I think that's something to be thinking about. And what goes along with that is also this idea of self-expression and creativity. So this is another thing that is also a positive thing that, you know, you get a tattoo because there's an aesthetic value. It's beautiful. 
you know, you appreciate the artwork. You want to be part of the artwork. You know, um, you are expressing yourself. You're expressing your uniqueness, you know, as, a, as an individual. And I think that is a very positive uh, reason to, you know, get body modification or tattoo. Now, again, you could go a little whole hog, and I show you the picture of the guy whose penis is, you know, he's definitely got some self-expression going on, but maybe that's a little bit too much. But again, maybe the job of art is to shock the rest of us. And so as an artist, that's really great. Like Orlan, I showed you the pictures of Orlan, the woman doing the plastic surgery as, a, as an art form. You know, she has certainly fulfilled the mandate of art to shock us, right? That's great. So whether you want to do that with your body or you want to do it some other way, um, you know, thank God we have artists out there doing this kind of stuff, you know. But again, we all we all have a need for some self-expression for creativity. So I think it's worth worthwhile thinking about that. Now, um, oh, I had some more stuff on tattoos. Ah. All right, so I think that's what I'm going to talk about for now. Any questions on this? So again, we can see tattoos, body modification. We can see that it could be an expression of pathology you know, of a way to kind of hold identity together, or it can be a way of, it could, it could be something that is positive. Okay. Now, what, there's been some studies, and I think I showed you, I can't miss this class, there's a class, there's a slide, there's been some studies that have shown that the more tattoos you have, we're talking about full body tattoos, especially facial tattoos, the more you probably need to worry about some pathology going on. So again, um, you know, this may, not, may or may not apply to the Yakuza who are doing body suits of these beautiful tattoos, but they, they're able to cover them up with a suit. You know, they wear a suit and it's covered. But once you start getting your face and your neck tattooed and everything, then you've got to wonder, at least that's what the research has been showing. Again, you know, we could go back to, say, self-expression, you know, extreme self-expression, artistic expression, you know, and you have to judge each case, I think, individually. Yeah? Does that include eyebrow piercings, tongue piercings? Yeah, I mean, I would include all the body modifications here that we've talked about. It could be branding, it could be, you know, whatever you're doing. It could be, you know, cutting off things. That gets extreme, um, you know, starting to modify your genitals to a certain degree becomes, you know, we've got to wonder what's going on. That may be getting a little extreme. And we're all, each of us are going to draw a line in the sand of where we think the self-expression ends and the pathology begins. And I, my guess is that we would all, if we, we could all hold each other, we would probably all disagree, you know, on the fine points, right? We might say, you know, yeah, you know, uh, a guy castrating himself as a form of self-expression or rebelliousness, that's a little too far. Probably most of us would agree with that, right? But then we start backing off from that and we're going to start having disagreements, right? So there's a line in the sand there, okay? And this line in the sand is going to be, sort of, to a large degree, culturally based. And again, we're going to get into culture-bound syndromes pretty soon. We'll start talking about some of these cultural uh, manifestations of these things. And we'll see that there's some differences. But I can show you one right now. This guy. So remember I showed you those guys pulling hooks and the guy getting the thing through the cheeks? This guy took an ancient ritual, Hindu ritual, and decided to modernize it by piercing his tongue with a drill. Now, I have a drill like this. Um, it's extremely powerful. Um, you do not need a drill that, 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 that powerful. Anytime they've got that bar on, it means it's like that thing's really going to go. Right? So you can use a much smaller drill, but he chose this very powerful drill. Um, but there you go, right? So again, um, some other things about uh, 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 body modification, self-mutilation. Um, we look at, at social groups we see some interesting things. We know that um, social settings greatly influences the onset of self-mutilation. Now remember I showed you the, that festival, that Hindu festival in Malaysia where they're putting hooks <coughs> and everybody, hey, that guy did it, he got the thing through his cheeks, looks like it didn't hurt him very much, I'm down for it, I'm gonna try it, I'm gonna trance, I'm gonna do it too, right? And so again, people influence each other to do these sorts of things. There are people down in Brazil, um, there's a guy in Brazil who uh, every year nails himself to a cross and goes to the stations of the cross like Jesus and has himself nailed to a cross. And then there's other people that will see that and they'll go, oh, you know, I'll try that, right? There are people who do that. The flagellants are really important, the guys who whip themselves, right? Because they've shown that if you are doing it by yourself, you can only take so much. But if you do it in a group with other people, what happens is a rhythm to the whipping becomes established. And from that rhythm, it allows you to kind of go into a trance, and then you can do more of it. And it's easier to get into that rhythm when you're in a group of people. And so again, there may be some 
some uh, influence from the group in, in things like this. Okay? Um, we've seen, again, going back to that paper I think I showed you, that, um, that you know, for self-mutilated behavior in psychiatric wards, um, this seems to be, have some sort of contagion to it. If one person does it, another person may try it. Um, and then again, you know, um, you know, again, these sort of culturally sanctioned things, you know, these sort of religious rituals, we'll see these sort of group, group uh, um, body modification or self mutilation Now, again, um, culturally sanctioned things are often associated with healing, spirituality, social status. Remember I showed you the African uh, people who would cut off, you know, a finger joint or something, you know, for as a funerary rite. Um, you know, again, that may have some, you know, psychological healing, uh, some spiritual aspect to it, some social status. Many religions, by the way, have body modification um, attached to uh, s some sort of religious uh, aspect. And if you think about most of the major religions in the world, like Christianity comes to mind, um, you know, as one, you know, that you see Jesus nailed to the cross, certainly some body modification going on there. Um, you see lots of followers, of Christian followers, especially in the early Christian church, um, you know, doing things, uh, you know, they're, they're being martyred, and so then the martyrs then, you know, encourage other people to do things like the flagellation and this kind of stuff. You know, hey, they went through suffering for, for, for you know, suffering. We're going to figure out a way to symbolically go through that kind of suffering. You see it in Hinduism. You see it in lots of religions. Okay? So again, the idea is underlying all this, in my opinion, is that you scourge the body to free the spirit. Okay? You know, the body is the source of sin, the body ties you to the world in some way, and so if you can suppress the bodily urges, then you can free your spirit. And you might even think of like extreme forms of meditation or yoga are also an example of this. You know, yoga is the same word root as to yoke. And so the idea is you're yoking the body to the mind. You know, you're controlling the, the body via the mind. And so you're able to yoke the bodily energies and turn them to a higher spiritual purpose. And that's one of the original ideas of yoga. I mean, it's not typically how it's practiced now in our society, but that's the, that's the original idea of yoga. Right? So there's, you know, there's some very extreme yoga practices. You know, and again, this is the idea. So, you know, I, I talked already about tattoos, so let me talk about some more detail about tattoos. Um, this is one of the most tattooed people. I believe this person is tattooed over every inch of their body. Notice they've got an ohm sign tattooed all over them. That probably took a long time. Um, very interesting uh, effect there. Um, tattoos may serve a protective function in individuals who have experienced relational loss and injury to the self by establishing a visible boundary and symbolic representation in the skin. This is a fascinating idea, and if you watch tattoo shows on TV, like I do, you will see, uh, you'll see lots of examples of this. There are lots and lots of memorial tattoos. Okay? Lots of more memorial tattoos. That somebody lost a family member, they lost a parent, they lost a spouse or sibling or a child, uh, they will go in as part of their grieving process or to, to memorialize getting through the grieving process or just to form a memory of the person. They will have a tattoo, usually a portrait, right? So this you see in these tattoo shows, some of these tattoo artists like Kat Von D in Los Angeles, they're excellent at doing portraits, you know, photorealistic portraits, you know, put on the skin of the person. And so they will find a picture of their father or their mother and they will have that portrait put on their skin. And again, this can serve as sort of um, uh, helping with the relational loss. Now, this goes into a psychoanalytic idea, which maybe I'll get to in a minute, um, about uh, linking objects. So I'll talk about that. I think I have another slide on that in a minute. Um, if we look at adolescents with multiple tattoos, um, this may have to do with a deficit in the ability to form mental representations. So the idea is if you were as a child, because your childhood was messed up, in your development, you had a difficult time internalizing mental representations of your parental figures because it was a mismatch with your parents. If in the words of D.W. Winnicott, you had not good enough mothering or not good enough parenting, and you were unable to successfully internalize these mental representations, which is one of the ways we can sort of define a personality disorder. Then the idea that you could have multiple tattoos, the tattoos would be a way that you actually um, 
are able to internalize in your skin those those uh, those early mental representations that you so desperately need as a person, so that your personality is 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 more stable. Okay? So that's more detail detail explanation of what I told you previously. So again, there's some idea that seeing this uh, tattoos can help doing this. Um, and again, some people think that the tattoo, having the tattoo on the skin, may be um, something for some people, may be uh, a way that they can experience. Uh, the holding that a mother would have held them, you know, as a little child, as a baby, and the mother, and maybe even the father too, but the holding of the parent of the mother and feeling that closeness next to the parent, and which allows you to start internalizing stuff from the parent. You know, it's some, if you had a messed up childhood, early childhood, you didn't get that mothering in that way, that holding, then the tattoo might be able to represent some of that. The tattoo may, may, may you have a, you know, the person may, represent that holding feeling that they got. Okay. Um, it's an interesting idea. Tattoo on the skin cup comes to represent the mother's touch, which was not properly experienced from a psychological point of view in early childhood. And this can be seen in patients who experience early psychic trauma related to mothering. And again, we know early psychic trauma is where we get personality disorders from. Um, and, they, and so later on, these people may get more tattoos, piercing, etc. Um, and again, when we look at these sort of cases, we see there might have been a lack of connection between early parenting and the and the very young uh, child. Again, it doesn't mean everybody who gets a tattoo is going through this. Only some people. Uh, so my dad. Uh, uh, He's a psychoanalyst, has written about this idea of linking objects. Okay, so you may have heard in other classes, or maybe not heard in other classes, about transitional objects. Do you guys study uh, Winnicott in any of your classes? Really? I should probably put Winnicott in my personality theory class. Huh, because you're probably not getting this anywhere. D.W. Winnicott was a British psychoanalyst who came up with this idea of the linking, o or the, of the transitional object, where you have a baby and a parent, usually the mother, not always necessarily the mother, usually the mother, and what happens is they form a bond. There's, there's, the, you know, that they are, they are mutually interacting with each other, and this is something that facilitates normal development of the child. So all of us theoretically went through and had some sort of relationship with our mother, okay? And in that relationship, what happens is as, as the child gets older, the mother separates more and starts to be gone, you know, for the child, right? When the baby's first born, it's being held constantly, but after a while, uh, the baby's put down to sleep, the baby sleeps on its own, the baby is, is separated, you know, at times from the mother, and, and children have to learn to tolerate that separation, right? And one, one normal way of development that that happens is that the child uh, is able to use a transitional object. So mommy's left me, I mean, by myself for a little bit, but I have a blanket, and I have my blankie, and I hold my blankie, or I suck my thumb, or I have a teddy bear, I have something there that soothes me, that, that, that reminds me that mom will come back. And over time, the child develops what we call object constancy. The child begins to realize, oh, mom went away for a little while, but the child will come back. Mom will come back, right? You know, mom will come back. And then what happens is there is a transitional object and the transitional object helps to facilitate that transition to that child being able to tolerate separation. Okay, so this can be a blanket or a, typically a blanket. Or anybody here have that pink blanket and you maybe you kept it until you were an adult, you know, because it reminded you of that, you know, which is also perfectly normal, right? Um, but these kind of kind of transitional objects. Now later on in life, um, especially if you had some problems in your early childhood, Maybe you didn't progress well beyond the stage of the transitional object, so you will continue to have transitional objects. And we can make all sorts of speculations about some what these things could be. Some of these things could be related to Freud's developmental stages, all sorts of kinds of things. You know, they used to say people who smoke cigarettes had an oral fixation. You could say, well, you know, they didn't get the orality, the st oral stimulation they needed from their mother, and so instead, you know, they used cigarettes. You know, the, so they 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 suck their thumb. And they, that was the transitional object. They never got beyond that. When they got older, they, they substituted the thumb for cigarettes, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. Uh, I had an aunt like this, an aunt who sucked her thumb in t well into adulthood to the point it caused like very bad dental problems. And she actually ended up losing her teeth and have to have dentures. 
So, you know, I mean, again, this is, that would be an, I, I, this is a sort of a transitional object pathology, if you will, okay? Um, so this is the idea. So my dad came up with sort of a, an elaboration of this idea of transitional objects. And he came up with what, something he called a linking object. And so again, if you think about the transitional objects being sort of the beginning of life, you know, when you're just establishing your relationship with your parents, it helps you to transition to being separated. Linking objects are really important sort of at the end of, at least at the end of your parents' life. So you have, you've established this link with your parents at normal development. You've internalized mental representations of your parents. And these have allowed you to develop and eventually go through development, all the developmental stages and eventually to individuate into your own person. But what happens when your parent dies, uh, goes away? Um, this person you've made, a, a, you have a mental representation of is no longer there. And you feel this loss. And so my dad, one of his areas of expertise is pathological mourning. He wrote a whole book about this, which we won't go into in this class. But the idea that you could have these uh, linking objects to a person who's passed on, okay, linking objects. And so we find this kind of thing that somebody has passed on and, and, and there'll be uh, one of these sort of um, um, uh, something that the person representing the person that you still have around that you'll keep around as a, as a, as a reminder of the person. And again, if this, this gets too overwrought, this can become very pathological, but there is sort of a level of this which is really quite normal. So there may be a personal possession of the deceased, you know. When my mom died, you know, and, um, you know, and, and we were dividing up all her stuff, and I saw her earrings there, and those earrings really reminded me of her. When she held me as a little kid, she wore those earrings. And I remembered her from those, so I really want to keep those. So I kept her earrings, right? Or I kept her ring, or I kept something about her. I kept this lock of her hair. It could be a gift or a symbolic farewell note, you know, again, the same idea, you know. Um, it could be something the deceased used to extend his or her senses or bodily functions. So my dad died and he left me his glasses, you know, his glasses were left over. So, you know, we didn't know what to do with stuff, but there's his glasses, so I took his glasses. And I can look at his glasses, I can look through them and see the world the way that he saw them. Okay. A realistic or symbolic representation of the deceased, we'll get back to that. A last minute object, these are really very interesting. So, you know, uh, you know, my mom died, and you know, last Friday she uh, had called me up and left a message on my answering machine. And now she's gone, and I cannot bring myself to, to erase the message on the answering machine. You know, that's the last recording of her voice ever. I can't erase it, you know, I got to keep that, you know. So that would be a last minute object. Mm -hmm. Create a linking object. You can also create things. You say, well, you know, uh, my dad smokes cigars. I know my dad loves cigars. I don't have one of his cigars, but I'm going to go buy a box of cigars, and that's going to keep it in the house. That's going to remind me of my dad. Okay. So these linking objects, uh, we see, if, again, if you watch the tattoo shows on TV, very, very common people are getting these memorial tattoos for a loved one. Very, very common. And again, in, in, in this representation, these tattoos can be a linking object. They are a realistic or symbolic representation of the deceased, but they're not just like a picture or something, but they're actually something that you get put onto your body. You actually have these parental inscriptions put onto your body. And so again, this idea that your parent serves this function, this mental representation function, that you know, allows you to uh, individuate, allows you to become your own person, that allows you to take whatever values you got from them and, 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 and make those permanent, uh, this makes a lot of sense. And so again, you see all these kind of Tattoos. Now, it doesn't have to be a person. It can be like, for instance, this guy had his dog put up there. It could be a father. It could be a sister. It could be not. A, uh, it could be a symbolic representation like this. This was actually a tattoo the person had done that reminded them of their parents, but it's not a picture of them. It could be a saying. Um, you know, it could be all sorts of things. But again, these have a memorial uh, aspect to them, which may be a linking, in a linking object sort of, um, uh, in a linking object sort of way. Does that make sense? So again, this is very, very common. Um, by the way, since we're looking at the dog tattoo, um, I just got a puppy. 
<laughs> just a couple weeks ago. And um, um, it's very interesting to watch the dog because my dog is going through the same separation individuation process. And we went to the dog trainer, so I leave the house, the dog freaks out. He has you know, separation anxiety. You know, I leave him for, like, he's probably freaking out right now at the house. It's all by himself, right? Separation anxiety. And what did she say to do? Oh, you got to give him a, a special toy that he really likes before you leave. And I go, ah, you mean we're going to give him a transitional object. And that'll help him, you know, remember that we're there. And then now I've started to do is put on, like, the TV, like the TV for dogs. In fact, he's watching it right now. It's like the dog TV. Again, trying to find transitional objects that will help him ease his separation. And what will happen after a while, after a couple weeks of this, what will likely happen is that he will develop some object constancy. He'll realize, even though I'm not there in the house with him, that I will come back. That he, can, he knows who I am. You know, because it's like little babies. You know, if you go away, you're, you're, you don't exist anymore, right? And then after a while, the kid grows up, they realize, oh, mom went away, but mom's going to come back, right? Same with the dog. It's actually exactly the same process with the dog. I don't know if anybody's written about this. I should write about this. <laughs> <laughs> it's exactly the same thing with the dog. The transitional objects, the whole thing. Um, now, the dog probably doesn't have the mental power for the linking object, but maybe, you know. You hear about these dogs, and the owner dies, and they go, they go to the, they wait out in front of the door at 5 p.m. every day, you know. That could be kind of a linking phenomenon. Yeah. There's linking objects. There's also linking phenomenon too. They don't have to be objects. They can be phenomenon. They can be behavior. There's a famous dog in Japan where after the owner died, it would show up like at the train station yeah. every single day. Yeah. So yeah. Really yeah. Really build like a whole statue around. Yeah. Them, like, yeah. yeah. So this would be this would be a linking phenomenon. So dogs do at least exhibit linking phenomena. Now my dog, I'm not sure. You know what's going on. He's a little dog. His brain's about the size of a walnut. You know. Oh, He's very sweet. I don't think he's terribly bright. Uh, <laughs> he's right home right now at this very moment, freaking out. In fact, I have one of those home cameras, those Nest, <laughs> and I, I, I can go on there and look at him. I'll do this during the break. I'll look and see what's going on, and I can talk to him. Yeah. But I'm not sure that helps. Yeah. Not, but he may make the camera may turn into a transitional object. You know, maybe that's where, you know, kind of it reminds me of him. I don't know. We'll see. Um, but this is a fascinating area, by the way. This is. This comes out of the, um, the, the, the neo-psychoanalytic um, uh, uh, people who do what they call this object relations theory. Object relations theory and object relations therapy. So any of you thinking going into clinical areas, this is a very good area uh, to work in clinically. So my clinical training is in this object relations school. This is this when I function as a clinician. This is the kind of stuff I used, you know, as, as a theoretical background to what I was doing. I, I find this stuff really fascinating. Unfortunately, if you want to learn this in grad school, you've got to pick a place to go that will teach you this, and many of them are not teaching this stuff now. Uh, but you certainly go, after you go to grad school, you can go to the Psychoanalytic Institute, you can learn all about this stuff. It's really quite fascinating. Or you can be crazy like me and go get another doctoral degree. That's how I did it, which was not, I would not recommend it for you guys. <laughs> Unless you're super masochistic. Okay, so um, they did some studies that have been done, uh, this is one of them, of college students and body piercings and tattoos. And uh, I'm just going to, I'm going to just basically break this down for you easy, you know, uh, in the easy way. Um, they, they basically thought, well, college students getting tattoos, this is a sign of some pathology, and those who don't get tattoos are the ones Tattoos and piercings are the ones who are more healthy, and they didn't find that. They found that ones uh, who, um, who, uh, who had tattoos uh, were fine, okay? and, and they, did, they, did, they did fine. So uh, no need to worry about that. Um, if you have tattoos, you can be completely normal. And uh, they looked at a religious school, they asked them about how they felt close to God, all these kind of things here. You can read through this very interesting article. Um, they found that people who, um, who had tattoos and or piercings were more likely to seek new and exciting experiences. Even if these experiences were illegal, but of course the illegal ones went way down. And um, they found people with tattoos very interested in piercing. Uh, and people who had a piercing were more likely to get another piercing. I think that makes a lot of sense, common sense, right? You got a piercing, you thought it was going to hurt, it didn't hurt that bad, you know, you lived through it, 
got the A, so you might do it again, right? It has a reinforcing quality to it. Um, and again, you can see, you know, do people with tattoos have more unprotected sex? Uh, no, not really. And so again, um, they weren't bigger drinkers. In fact, the people who, um, who, uh, who never, got, never got pierced were bigger drinkers. So you guys can read through this stuff. They weren't bigger, they weren't bigger druggies. People who didn't, never got pierced were bigger druggies. So, you know, again, you can read through this kind of thing. Uh, so again, it doesn't seem that, that tattoos are, are, are tattoos and piercings, getting these things, you know, it, for, among college students is, is necessarily a sign of pathology. Now, if, again, this may change if it came in and you were tattooed everywhere in your body and pierced everywhere, then we might wonder. But it looks in general like it, it, getting a tattoo or piercing, good news is, does not make you a freak. You're perfectly fine, you're perfectly normal, and you may be, may be more interested in getting some new novel experiences. So things are good, no need to worry about that. I love this picture, I just put this up because I really like this. It's three old dudes who've got full body tattoos. And somebody said to them, what are you going to do about your tattoos when you're older? You know, like, oh my god, you know, hear this? If your parents, my mom would tell me this, right? Yeah. Oh, you get a tattoo, it's going to be so ugly when you're old, you're going to regret having that, right? Yeah. So I love this thing, because they say, don't know, mate, probably grow an epic beard and hang out with other badass tattoo dudes and generally look awesome. What are you going to do when you look like every other old bastard? <laughs> well, I think this is cool, you know. Now, I have the advantage, because I'm older, if I get a tattoo now, it won't have faded away and got all stretchy. It'll probably stay that way until I die and I'll look like a beautiful corpse. So maybe this is the time for me to start indulging my tattoo, uh, get my tattoos on, I don't know. Um, but I just love this poster, that's pretty really cool. Okay, so you can read all this stuff here. This is basically what I just told you. Um, now again, another. this is again a little dated now, it's getting dated. In this sample, 23% of women but only 12% of men were tattooed and supports recent claims that women may be 50% of the individuals according, uh, to currently obtaining tattoos. Men and women both have uh, had more negative attitudes toward women with a visible tattoo than toward other women in the descriptions, looking at descriptions of women. So again, this may be dated, you know, I mean this would be another thing, you know, you could do in graduate school and go study this. I think now men seeing women with tattoos go, eh, hey, it looks good, or I don't like it, or but I don't think it's especially stigmatizing. I could be wrong about this. I mean, what do you guys think? Do you think that women showing tattoos are more stigmatizing? Yeah. I know, at least for speaking for me and my group of friends, yeah. if a girl had like one or two tattoos, like, oh, that's interesting. Yeah. If she has like, not a lot, but some tattoos, like, oh, okay, yeah. she's more fun or she's more adventurous or maybe she just likes getting tattooed but if she has like a lot a lot of tattoos yeah. i know from my group of friends that's like okay i like her she's awesome oh so and it's then, more attractive yeah it's like that yeah yeah because it shows like she yeah. has a commitment to this artwork and it shows that yeah. she is also like a pain tolerance thing which for some guys is impressive but like yeah. <laughs> my friends are weird yeah but like i know from me, personally, a woman with like a lot of tattoos, I'm like, that, I like her, she seems... So this is this would be a cool. great, great, great 301 project for those of you guys still doing 301s. You could do a survey on this. Survey on, on, on attitudes uh, toward uh, tattoos. But you could do it for men and women, right? What about women? What do you, when you see a guy with a tattoo, what do you think? Do you think, yeah, you care, attractive, not attractive? You know, what about more tattoos? I grew, when I'm growing up, my dad had three tattoos. Oh, well, then that explains your thing already. We don't so, even say no more, <laughs> right? So, yeah. um, if a guy has tattoos, I really, like, I find tattoos attractive. You like tattoos attractive, yeah. yeah. I think probably there's a lot less stigma about them. Again, remember I told you when I was in college, you know, only certain people had tattoos. The drug dealers from the biker gang mm -hmm. selling drugs to college students and the ex-military people, that was it. And so there was, and so when you saw somebody with a tattoo, you immediately tried to, and, and for women it would have been strippers, right? Had tattoos. And then, so when you saw somebody with a tattoo, you'd immediately try to categorize, what, what category do they belong? Because I don't really want to hang out with the biker, that guy's dangerous. The military guy, stripper's okay, but I don't want to hang out with the biker, right? So you immediately try to categorize the people, right? Nowadays, I think that doesn't really exist. I mean, you know, I, I don't know. Yes? I even have some guy friends that kind of, like, contradictory to what you had said. Like, mm -hmm. I yeah. was, like, helping my friend on his Twitter page, 
Yeah. And um, I guess we came across a girl, and she had like a little small tattoo, like maybe like right here. Yeah. And he was like, nope, like absolutely no tattoos. No, no tattoos. No, no, no. <laughs> so one of you guys has to do this as a three or one project. This would be, and I'll, I'll, I'll help you. I'll help you do the statistics and stuff, so it'll make it easy for you. This would be a great 301 project to do. And uh, I, I have a former student of mine, Mike, who is um, finishing his doctorate at Cal Lutheran, and he runs a drug rehab clinic in Oxnard, and we are, in part of his dissertation, he collected information on the tattoos of his um, people in his clinic, who mostly are jail referral people. And so we're going to look at placement of the tattoo, size, how many, um, and see if it corresponds to, um, you know, whatever pathologies and criminality things they may have. So we're very interested in this stuff. Somebody ought to do this. Really, I'm serious about this. Somebody ought to do this for 301. And you tell Dr. Key, whoever your teacher is, Dr. Teranisha Martinez, that I said you should do this and I'll help you. Okay, so think about it. Think about it. Really good idea. You know, you should get some information about this. It can be publishing. Okay. All right. So again, uh, again, this is a 2004 article. It is a little bit, um, probably a little dated. This probably needs to be, uh, you know, uh, upgraded. By the way, this woman uh, with the stars on her face, uh, she was a woman who went into the tattoo parlor and she'd been drinking and uh, said, I want you to tattoo stars and stuff on my face. And the tattoo artist said, no. First of all, you're drunk. And um, it's a facial tattoo, so you really got to you know, be committed, and I don't think you are. And she badgered him, badgered him, badgered him, offered him enough money, so eventually he did it. Tattooed her face, the stars. She woke up the next morning, freaked out, and went back and sued the guy. And went through a whole lawsuit. They even offered to like, pay for the removal and everything. She still sued him. I don't know what happened after that. Um, this is why if you go to a tattoo parlor and you've been drinking or you're high, uh, they will probably not give you a tattoo. Especially something on your face. So again, don't 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 try that at all. Okay. All right. Questions about tattoos? We'll leave it there. There's a lot more we can say about it. A lot more interesting things going on. Let's talk a little bit about uh, plastic surgery. I don't want to spend a whole lot of time on this, but just so you know about plastic surgery. Um, and these stats are a little bit older. Uh, I probably should need to update these. But the last things I looked at were talking about pretty similar stuff. If anything, uh, these are probably increased. And, and again, we're near LA, and so we're near one of the capitals in the United States for plastic surgery. What is the country in the world where the most plastic surgery is done right now? What? No. No. What is the country right now where plastic surgery is really entered in part of the culture? In fact, we talk about uh, rites of passage. This country uh, for for especially for young women, uh, some plastic surgery, even the teen years, is a rite of passage. China? No. Is it the U.S.? No. Australia. Korea, oh. South Korea. Really? Oh. South Korea, yeah. And Brazil, uh, Brazil used to be one of the plastic uh, surgery uh, meccas of the world, and now um, it, it's become uh, South Korea. Of course, there's a lot done in the United States. And we live near Los Angeles, so of course, I don't know anybody been down to Los Angeles recently and wandered around, you will see a ton of plastic surgery done on males and females, quite a bit. Uh, so we live in one of the meccas of plastic surgery. Um, about 53% of women, 49% of men, roughly half and half, uh, uh, say they approve of cosmetic surgery. So about half of people think it's fine. 67% of Americans would not be embarrassed. Their friends or family knew they had cosmetic surgery. I attribute this statistic to uh, Kathy Griffin, you know Kathy Griffin, the comedian, mm -hmm. who's come out very, very vocally and said, yeah, I've had tons of plastic surgery done. You have to have plastic surgery to, to, um, to exist in my profession and continue to work. Now, I saw her recently, and I would say she's probably got over the top a little bit. I think she's done a little too much. She's starting to look a little freakish. Um, but she's had quite a bit done, okay? and I think this is Pretty typical, true, that most people would, would, wouldn't care. Okay. About 27% of married Americans and 33% of unmarried Americans would consider cosmetic surgery for themselves now or in the future. Uh, I was telling my wife about this statistic, and she said to me, oh, yeah, that just means that they're, 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 they're thinking of leaving their spouse and going to somebody else. And we call that getting the bait ready. So that was her, her term, not mine. <laughs> 
getting the bait ready is okay among married people. So, who knows? Again, another good research topic there. 67% uh, of white Americans, 72% of non-white Americans say they would not be embarrassed about having uh, cosmetic surgery. So we're not seeing a lot of difference by, uh, at least by uh, uh, white versus non-white ethnicity. Most Americans, 71% said their attitude toward cosmetic surgery had not changed in the last five years, though 20% said it was more favorable. Out of all age groups, men and women between the ages of 18 and 24 are the most likely to consider plastic surgery for themselves now or in the future. It's not old dudes like me who want to cure all the sagging stuff. You know, it is young people like you guys who are getting most of the plastic surgery. That's quite fascinating. Okay, quite fascinating. Well, it kind of makes sense. You want to enjoy it for longer. 77% um, of Americans 65 or older say they would not be embarrassed about having cosmetic surgery. So old people also don't, don't mind. Okay. And so here's some images of plastic surgery. Um, we see the top of this woman's face, which is perfectly nice. Um, that did not seem like that was an improvement. Here we see a guy, you know, he's got some love handles, you know, he gets a little liposuction. And here we see a very typical thing, which you typically see in Los Angeles, a woman uh, with perfectly uh, normal, good breasts, uh, having them enhanced and having perfectly normally large breasts. So again, very common, uh, especially in our part of the world, to see this sort of thing. Okay. Um, here are all the different kinds of uh, um, different kinds of plastic surgery that can be done. There's quite a lot of things that they can do now. Um, all sorts of stuff. Uh, you can read through all this stuff. I just like this this advertisement by a plastic surgeon, my beautiful mommy. If you had any doubts that we're living in a narcissistic society, nothing can tell you more than you can this. My beautiful mom. Well, what's important is that my mom looks beautiful, not that she's paying attention to me. <laughs> I thought that was fascinating. Uh, so not just women, uh, also guys uh, getting lots of plastic surgery, and here's some of the things they get done. Um, I don't know. You know. I, I mean, look, they could make me look like this guy. I, I'm, I'm, I'm all. I'm, 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 fortunately, I am a public employee and cannot afford such things. Uh, but if I wanted to be on TV, I would probably have to go get some work done. You know, that's the deal. I mean, um, you know, there's a certain expectation the TV industry in LA drives a lot of the plastic surgery. Okay, world's love affair. Again, South Korea, this is a little old. Um, I believe South Korea has now overtaken everybody. Um, uh, it's part of the worldwide total. South Korea is a very small country. And so if, for it to have 5% of the total plastic surgeries in the world is huge. You know, the United States is much bigger, m many, many more people, and we're 20%. So again, you can think about that. But I believe now South Korea is the capital of plastic surgery. I have to check on that. But if you look at just numbers, sheer numbers around the world, this is, at least as of 2014, this is what was going on. So United States, Brazil, Japan, quite a few, South Korea, Mexico, Germany, France, and Colombia. I don't know why Colombia. Yeah. 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 Okay. Uh, again, you can see this. So this is a later. This was in 2010. This is um, different kinds of plastic surgery, and this is done by like um, percentages. And this one you see, South Korea is the is is one of the highest ones. A lot of non-invasive surgery in non-invasive stuff in Korea too. Skin and hair are non-invasive, considered being non-invasive. And again, top five surgical procedures in 2012, uh, breast augmentation, uh, 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 liposuction are the two biggest. Um, and the, actually these two, this is lipoplasty, liposuction, and then tummy tuck, which goes along, this kind of go along together. Uh, this blare of Plastic, can't pronounce it. This is eyelid surgery. This is very common in South Korea. A lot of South Koreans get eyelid surgery. Very, very common. Rhinoplasty is a nose job. Uh, top five non-surgical procedures. Botox is the main one. You have a deadly poison injected into your skin, and you can smooth out your wrinkles. So there you go. Okay. Uh, we can see the, the big, big increase in a number of these things, especially breast augmentation and liposuction. Other things have been big increase the last few years, and again we can see uh, for guys the biggest uh, surgery is liposuction. Okay. 
Now, you can, can you become addicted to plastic surgery? Can this become an addiction? Can this become a, 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 a result of some body dysmorphia, body dysmorphic disorder, where you never feel your body's right, or as my dad would say, you're hallucinating things about your body. Um, you know, it's kind of similar in a way to like anorexia, you know, where the anorexic person looks in the mirror and they see a 300 pound person and they actually weigh 80 pounds. Is this possible? And it's, it, 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 possibly. Okay. And so, um, you know, not to pick on Michael Jackson, um, not that I, you guys see that, uh, that thing about the, the, the film about him, about the guys that were supposedly molested by him. Yeah, yeah it's pretty, 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 I, I was, you know, putting on my psychology hat, it was like, I, I, I felt it really rang true for me. So I don't want to pick on Michael Jackson, but yeah, yeah the guy had issues. Okay. And so you can see that this video is still up. This is a video of, uh, sorry about that, we're gonna get that in a minute, of his transformation. <laughs> I'm gonna give away the stuff before lunch. Um, so you can see this is like a, um, I'm sorry about this. Uh, you can see this, this sort of uh, um, progression. So this is this is uh, this guy had a lot of plastic surgery oh, over the years. Yeah. Oh. I didn't even recognize him there. You can see the nose is thinning out, yeah. the lips are thinning, the skin is, is, is being lightened. No. No. Yeah. So he had a lot of work done. So well, this is an addiction, you know. Maybe the skin whitening was due to vitiligo, you know, where the you get patches of of, of skin, you know, that's possible, but it certainly had other stuff besides that done. So again, um, yeah, and, and we don't really know, you know, we know his childhood wasn't great, um, uh, you know, 